Oh, sounds great. <laughs> oh, and then we sang it. I guess I should. Yeah, we made a video of us singing it. Yeah. Good to be there. Oh, you didn't just tell them about it? No. <laughs> you guys oh, we did this. For you. Happy birthday. We'll we're we'll hey, we're <laughs> live, ladies and gentlemen. What's up? Holla at your boy. This is Len, a.k.a. The Bad Hello. Hello, Hello, la, 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 la. Hi. Hi, with Len this week is Johnny Destructo, a.k.a. the Thwip Tribble. Which one of us is that? <laughs> uh, and I have the brilliant designation of Superman's pal, Jimmy Tribble, a.k.a. Noel. I feel the Tribble name is more important than my actual Christian given name at this point. Hmm. Uh, Brian Lee is one of my names. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is Legion. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this very special Black Tribbles and Colt Pop edition. We call it gutter talk, but it's really just four guys getting together on camera and shooting the shit just for you in these COVID days. And today we have an interesting topic that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about how do you cope with the fictitious deaths in your life because it, uh, this all came about because I was looking at my daughter's Facebook page and she was she answered this question about how she you know about fictitious deaths that meant this much to her and she mentioned some character from anime that I knew nothing about but made her ball her eyes out mm. um and I was like, oh, that's an interesting question. And I saw other people talking about that. And it made me think, wow, there are some deaths that have happened in comic books or in pop culture that definitely have resonated with me. And I wonder why have they resonated with me? Some because of personal reasons, some because the writing was so good, um, some for reasons that I not really explored. And it might be fun to explore that. So I asked my friends to come help me explore it. And they agreed. Thank Under you, penalty fellas. of death, but I was yeah, gonna say, I, mean, I would agree. Paid. I don't know about the rest of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ooh, what a character situation! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as always, ladies and gentlemen, we that are watching us as we are streaming live on YouTube and as well as on youtube.com uh, slash black tribbles and in our Facebook group, Tribble Nation. We invite each and every one of you to um sit in and listen and enjoy enjoy the show and feel free to pipe in with your comments with your thoughts your concerns action figure expert i see has piped in saying hello what's up dude how you doing yeah Thanks what's for up? Checking us out. um and we're not gonna we're, we're gonna get right into this and start talking about fictitious deaths that mean a lot lot to us and one of the first ones that really the first one that just always just comes to my mind and, and we're going to we deal with comic books on gutter talk um so we're going to start with comic books and then we're going to get more into like you know pop culture and everything like that and one of the first deaths in the comic book that really truly resonated with me is um actually it was from the teen titans it was when tara died at the end of the Judas contract, the original Judas contract in the comic book. Um, because up until then, even though she, you know, spoiler alert, Tara proved to be a traitor to the to the Teen Titans. Yes, JD, it's true. Um, but up until then, when, the, when a character in, in comics would be a traitor, especially if she was, you know, uh, drawn in such a... a um, adorable way as George Perez rendered uh, Tara you were just waiting for the flip you were just waiting for them you know to the come to Jesus moment and they come back on the side of the angel and with Tara it never really happened she just got darker and darker and darker um, and that it, but but it resonated with me because she Beast Boy, Gar Logan in the comic book, had developed such a relationship with her that it hit him and he couldn't believe that she didn't flip. And it tore him up. Tore him up so much that, you know, Tara, who was famously manipulated by Deathstroke, 
he became like a bitter enemy to Deathstroke. And then it all culminates, like, I think, like, even years down the line where there's a, a fantastic issue where Gar Logan and Deathstroke sit down in a diner and they just have a conversation about Terra and about how they both felt about her. And I thought, wow, that was just a cool ass exploration ah, of the that character. And the men that loved her. Yeah, yes, that's exactly. actually really cool. Yeah. Exactly. It was really dope. And and that was the one that really hit me for the first time. That really hit me in my feels, man. Ooh. Most definitely. Do y'all remember Tara dying? Jay no. I knew of it. Like, I knew of it being referenced. Uh, who, who wrote that diner scene? Was that back during the Perez uh, Wolfman days? Or no, is that, that later? actually was years later. Um, no, I rem no the, the diner scene. Yeah, you froze up a little bit, JD. Repeat that. And now JD is frozen. All the it way. was uh, he. Well, he had asked um, who wrote the diner scene part. He like it wasn't. It wasn't Perez and, and Wolfman, right? It wasn't Perez and Wolfman, but I believe it may have been Wolfman that wrote it. It was years later, and Wolfman was still writing the book. I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, but Perez and Long gotcha. lost the, left the book. Um. But yeah, but but when I think about the reason why that struck me is because that was the first time that, like, to me, comic books got real. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, there have been deaths before, but usually they get turned around. And this was like the '80s. Um, but this one, this one just really just struck me because of the exploration of the feelings behind it, especially when it's you. Because mm -hmm. if it's a villain, then it's you know, it's a come up, you know, they got what they had coming, you know what I mean? Yeah. And quiet is kept, I'm sorry to say, but when it's the hero's, you know, um, lady or boy love, well, within two issues, they usually have another one, you know what I mean? So it's like, hmm. it, they, they tend to be a little bit disposable. The less disposable ones never leave, aka Lois Lane, you know what I mean? So, right. But this one, it just really, it, it, it just hit me hard, man. It hit me in my feels. I, don't know why. I, I only know of that. I only know of that, like, grand story um, in so much as the, well, the gravitas of it. You know, like, the uh, the Terra Saga is something that they just, that is, the Judas contract is something that's talked about, like, legend. Even for those that didn't read it on, like, I still have never read it, but I know every beat of it because it's, like, part of popular True. culture at this point. True. So like that makes sense as something that like if I was reading it in the time I could imagine it just being so incredibly effective. Yeah. Yeah. It was most definitely. JD, is there a comic book death that resonates with you? Action figure experts is showing some love for the death of Superman. Which oh yeah, a, that's cool. Which was a huge thing. Yeah, man, big. that was I mean, big back the, in the day. It, it made the news and everything. Yeah. I didn't even read comics regularly back then. Like, there's a good gap of time, for, like for like ten years, and I knew about that and went to shops to pick up the to the books. That was just across the board. Yeah. Everyone felt it. See, that's interesting. Yeah. Like, were you weren't really reading comic books at that time? I gotta imagine that you, Brian. I know you, JD, were reading comic books at that time. Did the death of Superman resonate with you? The two that's of you? my. Number one, that is the first thing that I was going to bring up. Like, that's my top wow. resonating death, is the death of Superman. Well, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Why so? Go ahead. Um, at least the maybe the earlier. What's that? Why is that? Yes. Well, um, I'll tell you what. It was, I guess, built up so much, you know. So there was, like, a lot of anticipation. Like, you knew that it was going to come. And it was so big, right? It was like Superman. The guy who, you know, you would never have even considered dying uh, was going to die. And, uh, you know, it keeps uh, Doomsday is rampaging across the U.S. And everyone's throwing everything they can at him and nothing is working, you know, slowing him down a little bit, maybe removing parts of his clothing. Because remember, for the beginning, <laughs> well, yeah, but it was like you know, uniform not a costume. It was like hey, holding it. Uh, it was trapping him. That's what it was. It was like a handcuff, I guess. It's, I don't know. Uh, like a... Yeah, it was, 
behind it, but it was only one or he had one free. I forget. But, um, <laughs> you know, so he's doing <laughs> so he's doing this and, uh, you know, he winds up in Metropolis and the only guy that can stand against him is the greatest hero, you know, in the world and uh, Superman. And um, oh, I, I was who are you talking about? about? Yeah. <laughs> I, was, um, I was on pins and needles. I was like, wait, who is this guy? Who's your goal? Who are you referring to? Steven. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Olsen. I'm Steven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steven and he's the universe. Like Doomsday. And Doomsday killed him. So <laughs> but it was gumption. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, like, I, I know this didn't happen, but I, I presume uh, to save Superman's life, Jimmy Olsen and the, the Newsboy Legion probably could have taken him. Well, it was conjecture. Probably so. Probably, yeah. yeah. And they were clones at that time anyway, the Newsboy Legion. Yeah, casual yeah. clones, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's all thing. That's um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always like that stuff. Um, so anyway, you know, it was, such, it was such a huge moment. It affected me so greatly that I... I had like all of the issues and I took the time to to put them all in bags and whatever, but also number them mm -hmm. both in the overall story, death and return of Superman and then the rain or death rain and then return of Superman, but then individually. So each one had two small post-it notes on it that was like the number in the overall and the number in that part. And it like I got choked up when I read the death of Superman. He, he beats Doomsday, but he has to sacrifice himself as well. Um, it was, yeah, it choked me up. I like this uh, action figure expert. Doomsday was in what's called containment shoes. Shoes. <laughs> containment <laughs> shoes. They were, they were Doc Martin-esque. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were um, at the time. So, uh, Brian, let me ask you this. Yeah. Let me let me ask you this. I just want to ask you this real quick. If I could just ask you this, let me ask you this. Um, Podcast when, voice. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> I, I, I was young enough at the time when the Superman died mm -hmm. that I was actually like, are, uh, are they are they not going to bring him back? Maybe he's dead. Are these he dead? Maybe he's dead. Oh and, really? I mean, I'm younger than you. I don't remember right. by a cut. Well, that's how it is. By <laughs> <laughs> one or two years, I think. Right. Um, but I don't remember if I thought that he was going to stay dead. I remember knowing about the reign of the Superman, and I think we knew about that, uh, like a little bit before he died, or the order they of were, they were seeding little things about these replacements that happened like during yeah. the whole funeral of a, a friend yeah. series. So it was like yeah. the big battle, and then funeral of a friend was eight fucking uh, issues, funeral for a friend. Uh, yeah. Of like seating little things, yeah. Um, I so I didn't read it in real time. I, I like I was, um, in the small town in in Florida that I grew up in. There was no hobby shops. There was literally one comic shop, and it's not like I drove. Mm -hmm. So it was hearing about this thing that's happening and mm -hmm. and not getting consistent issues on racks at like Seven Elevens and grocery stores. Mm -hmm. So I read the lead up to Death of Superman slowly in chunks hmm. and then knowing on the news that it was about to happen i begged my parents to take me to the closest comic shop and just picked up everything that was there and then i i feel like the whole death and return of superman in my you know perspective of a 10 year old nine ten year old i don't know i haven't done the math but just like the idea of it was about six months to a year because i wasn't getting stuff as it was coming out right. i was getting it whenever i was able to go to a shop or or it was on the news racks at the supermarket because there was more than just the direct market back then. I mean, it was a while. It was it, a long. It was forever. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which apparently was because it wasn't going to go on quite that long, but it was generated so much interest that they carried it on a little bit longer. But also with Reign of the Superman, we thought, or at least they said one of these, which one yeah. is Superman? That's so frustrating. I, I, I bought yeah. it. I had I all four like, first oh. issues, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was like, oh, one of these is going to be Superman. Which one's it going to be? This doesn't make any goddamn sense. Oh, it's not. Great, thanks. I thought it was going to be two, but I was totally cool with it. Like, I the whole ride, because I liked those characters. As, they were fun. Was, yeah, yeah. Was anyone else really upset when they did the whole turn of Cyborg Superman was really him? And then you had to believe oh. it for, like, a couple of issues before he turned? That it was, was really Kal-El. Yeah. 
Well, yeah, uh, because I, I read, you know, again, I was only getting pieces. So right. I read, I was reading and he was like, so this is Superman now? He looks uh, like the Terminator. Right. Okay. I don't recall when they, yeah, I don't think, I don't remember if I bought it or not. Yeah. I don't uh, remember that. Yeah. So was I, it revealed that that Cyborg Superman was Superman? Metropolis was believing him for a while. Like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. He you know was the one that, that bubbled to the top. I well, he was the one who had all of the memories and everything. And exactly. He like him in the part that was. I think I yeah. did buy it for a minute. That it was at least like he's the most likely candidate. You know, I bought it in so much as I hated it, so I kept reading. Uh, I was to like, this day, I had. To this day, I love that design. It's cool. And it's so like I'm glad that he stuck around too. Um, although his design has been a little it's tough. Anyway, so I had the issue that he appears in, and I always loved it. It's like a Fantastic Four. Do you guys remember that? And yeah. I always thought it was awesome. So when he came back, I was like, "Holy crap!" What the fuck? Same, same <laughs> from that issue. <laughs> Yeah, 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 that was like a Jeff Johns moment for me before Jeff mm -hmm. Johns happened. Like mm -hmm. he took something that already existed and I was, yeah. you know, I wasn't a big Superman fan, but I happened to read, have read that issue. Mm -hmm. So when he, I was like, you referenced the one Superman issue yeah. I've read. Yeah. That's awesome. And it's like, yeah. and he's in Kryptonian technology when he leads in that. And he's got it like it, it all works and it's, yeah. it's exciting. It was cool. Yeah. Um, I think, I think Len wants us to, to get to the next one. <laughs> oh, no. I, was just, I was sitting here listening. I was enjoying listening to you gullible youths being taken in by this ruse of the we, devil of Superman. We were but babes. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I I thought for sure. I was like, oh, shit. I guess he's dead. <laughs> I mean, I, I knew. I mean, yes, I was older than y'all. So, but I still knew that the flagship character, mm. they were not going to kill. You mm. can get away with killing to a degree Batman because Batman has has his successor lined up right behind him hmm. in Dick Grayson and if you want to go uh, Jason Todd or Tim Drake or whomever, right? And at the end of the day, you throw them in the mask and for the most part, unless you've got a really good artist that draws the body types totally um, different, same. A lot of people will buy it as Batman, you know even story I mean? wise, even not just art wise, but just I, like story. yeah. I was I was gonna say like um, I think what was it for Detective Comics Black Mirror? Uh, Scott Snyder literally said like even though in continuity it's supposed to be Dick Grayson, he wrote it as though it's just Batman. Right. But in that story, there's almost no reference to it's not yeah. Bruce Wayne because yeah. it's like yeah to to make it evergreen because no one's gonna know twenty years from now. Exactly, yeah. but yeah. with Superman, but Superman, you can't get a you can't like just have you know. Oh no, now it's Connor Kent. No, you can't. Yeah. You can't. <laughs> you can't have Arnold Schwarzenegger terminate a Superman. You can't. So I knew right off the bat. Plus, plus, and this is this is a, a, maybe a little bit of the cynical lens that was developing at that time. But when he dies in that book, one. I didn't believe, and I'm just not a big Dan, Dan Jurgens fan, so I didn't believe that like this book that was drawn by Dan Jurgens was going to be all that important because I just don't believe Dan Jurgens that great of an artist. Then wow. the, the, Justice oh, League, shit. the Justice League that was in there was like, like Justice League, like Justice, just just let us league. Yeah. Like, they, <laughs> were, <laughs> they were like so cool. It was like blood win. It's just ice. <laughs> yeah, just ice league. Like, you know what I mean? Do you remember it, who blood win turned out to be? Well, yeah, because they realized like, yeah, Ooh. this was dumb. He, he turned, was the Martian Manhunter, but then it turned out there was a real one. He had a cool costume design too. I was it was, jump it was so dumb. I did not know that. Yeah. It, it, and, and I will forget it tomorrow. It, 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 so did everybody else. <laughs> Hi, Sam. <laughs> Wait, where? She's watching. She's oh. watching. She's watching. What a creeper. She's right over there. <laughs> so like so 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 because of that, I guess the 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 death of Superman didn't 100% resonate with me. Like the biggest the biggest thing that ever resonated with me was Superman, but and this is a Superman death though is in the comic book um Ah, uh, and I didn't know I was going to talk about it, so I didn't look it up. Superman. <laughs> Action? No. 
It's um, <laughs> it, it's um, it, it, JD knows a comic. I think it's called. I Give us some details. It, What's the story? It's, it's it's Mark it's Mark Wade and Stuart Eminem. Um, and next wave. Secret Identity by oh, Kurt Secret Kurt Identity. Kurt Secret Eminem. Identity. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And that, is, and that is that right over there. Super. I got it. Wasn't there. that Kurt Busiek? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, right. It's Kurt Busiek and Stuart Eminem as yeah, the artist. Yeah. And it, it posits Superman, more or less like Superman is on our, on our Earth, yeah. right? And yeah. he marries his own uh, Lois Lane, who is yeah. actually like an indigenous woman. Um, and he ages, has oh, daughters. Who, I thought you meant she was indigenous to his Earth. Well, indigenous to... Uh, yeah, right, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> right, sorry. I got I'm excited yeah. because I love the book. No, um, it's... Yeah, yeah. And he ages in the book, and he ages out of being Superman, and it's a beautiful story, mm -hmm. and it's one of the rare comic books that where if if I remember correctly, you don't see him die in the book, but he is yeah. so aged in the book that you know it's more or less, you know, got, he's going it's to. Been, it's been at least a decade since I read it. I don't remember. I remember yeah. him being done. But I don't remember if they show him dying or not. Yeah, I don't think they show him dying, but they show him like he's like like real, yeah. you know, gray, and he's flying with his daughters, yeah. and his yeah. daughters take off past him, and it's just a beautiful sentiment to the character. Yeah. Um, and uh, I cried when I I read that, and then I also cried, and you don't see him dying in All Star Superman uh, by Mike Miller. No. no, 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 no. Grant no, Morrison. Grant Morrison. Grant Morrison. I'm not good with writers. Grant Morrison and Frank Whiteley. Ooh. And Superman goes flying off. And dude, I was a little kid. Because part of me was like, yeah, Superman is up in the sun, man. Keep protecting all of us. He's like keeping the sun going. Because that's what happened at the end of that book. Oh, my God. I, that's the Superman that hit me. That's that's the death of Superman that struck with me. Why are you looking like that, J.D.? Because uh, I'm reading Domo Kyle's comment, where all the white don't, women Don't, 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 don't. What does that don't. mean? Okay. So mine, thank you for asking, Len, 20 minutes ago. Mine is, uh, hey, you since, you had, since you had brought up uh, the first one that hit you uh, and sort of brought uh, death to comic books door for you, mine was actually Jason Todd. Mm. Mm. So uh, my the first T-shirt, I'm a, you know, I design and print t-shirts as a hobby. And my first one was Jason Todd had it coming. And it's a, you know, it's a skull and crossbones, but the crossbones are the crowbars. Right. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that was the first time I think I remember reading in real time, the death of a character. And it was even more brutal in that DC comics during the issues would have an ad in the back that said, Hey kids, you want Robin to be murdered? You bloodthirsty little shits. Call this phone number and vote, you heathens. Uh, so I did. Um, <laughs> Would you vote? And, uh, and I voted. The T-shirt was born. <laughs> I voted to kill him just because uh, I was like, they're not going to do it. Who, who, who puts it out there as a, as a, a you know, a choose your own adventure to murder a child? Oh, what DC does. Oh, they did it. Oh, yeah. What if, yeah that's why. What if it was all guys like you that was like, there's no way. I'll get yeah. Votes. <laughs> you're like, but also. You're like, you're I, like those white supremacists who walk into the booth and like, <laughs> I just voted for Barack Obama. <laughs> he yeah. <fucking> won. <laughs> yeah, guess, just like that. <laughs> um, so uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, anyway, um, they murdered him, and it was brutal, and uh, it actually affected me. I was like, oh, man, this is this is sad. <laughs> this sucks. Um, but Jason Todd sucked. Too. I, I did not like him as a Robin. He was such a petulant little shit. He was always jumping ahead and like being just being like a cocky little shit, really. Um, <laughs> and so when he was replaced by Tim Drake, I was like, oh, here we go. Here's a good Robin. I like this kid. Ooh. But yeah, I thought that event was crazy. To this day, it, it seems crazy. crazy to me that this this multi million dollar comic book company would be like, hey guys, you want to murder a child with us? What do you think? Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's not one of their more prouder moments. Most definitely, man. Yeah. But Jason got a, a raw deal because he wasn't like that when he was originally written. He was right. basically written originally as a Dick Grayson clone. And mm -hmm. it was only after Crisis that they kind of like started switching it up. Um, I don't then, think I've read a single issue of Silver Age Jason Todd. I keep forgetting that that was a thing. 
Because he yeah. had red hair, right? Or, yeah, he was dyeing his hair and stuff. Yeah. 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 I don't think it was for very long either. I feel. No. Like. Yeah. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Because he came he came upon the scene not long before they decided that they were going to do the crisis. So yeah. he was around in like the when they started seeding all of that stuff leading up. So he was just like, yeah, whatever, you know, because they knew yeah. they were going to be rebooting it. His his continuity wasn't so deep that they couldn't just do whatever the fuck they wanted outside of of crisis or on the other side of crisis. Right, right. Um, someone hit us up and said the worst death for me was Colossus sacrificing himself uh, for the legacy. Uh, I remember that. That's yeah. uh, Dom Kyle again. Okay, so Dom Dom is uh, um, he's making up for his crass comment earlier that had nothing to do with the conversation. So, uh, oh, he he let me know I, it's I, a I, line I, from the movie Blazing Saddles. It is. I, yeah. I know. It's a good movie. <laughs> um. Uh, very added. Uh, and then action figure expert made a mention of one that I have of later coming up. Uh, let's, let's go to Noel. Noel, is there a yeah. comic book death, death that resonated with you, brother? Um, well, I like I had mentioned before, I've got a little bit of a gap in my readership. Like I read as a as a youngin up until like maybe age eight or nine, and then essentially took a break from comic books for the most part until like late in high school, college. So I've got a really, really big gap and I went backwards for a lot of stuff, but mm -hmm. um, I have a, I, my heart doesn't work the right way. So I have trouble really feeling emotions, especially sad emotions and it affecting me outwardly when I'm reading something. Oh. When I'm reading something, it's, it's a little bit of a, of a distance or a separation. Like I can, I can make the connection that like, this is awful, but I don't get emotionally affected. Mm. A movie, I, a movie, a song, I will. But for some reason, when I'm reading a comic, it just like I don't have, I don't get tears. Mm. So the two things that I could really like, there's two that shocked me. I'll go with shock over. I was crying when I read it. Um, the first one was Avengers disassembled when Hawkeye went. Mm. That was okay. shocking to me. Because even at that point, too, I, like it was when Bendis first, it was his first like opening salvo, a new Avengers run, essentially destroying the entire team. I read it um, under protest in collected edition and didn't really know that it literally was destroying the team entirely. And you don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> and I remember there being kind of controversy online about how he killed Hawkeye. Um, and the way that I, I, the way that I read it apparently was the correct way. And the way that other people read it was the incorrect way. Uh, like he, his last lines are not, not like this, not like this, not like this. As he like takes a, a, a skiff and takes out an entire helicarrier of bad guys. Right. Right. Um, but it was supposed to be not like this because he thinks he's about to die <laughs> like this and takes it and takes out a whole helicarrier of bad guys first like the idea like the inflection is completely different going oh, out like a hero oh. and getting destroyed that's how i read it and i was like this is this is this is fucking insane and it's only the second mm. issue of this series what's happening mm. and like that's right after she hulk rips apart the vision too so like it was very uh. it was very insane it was very emotionally investing and i was oh. in it i was in it yeah. um so that was like that was one that really got to me <laughs> And it wasn't until House of M that they kind of brought him back in pieces. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is, this, this is, um, from then on, he's always been a favorite character because mm -hmm. I love that idea of him being, of him making the ultimate sacrifice and what he thought was something altruistic to find out later on that it was fabricated, manipulated, and now it no longer counts because he's back, mm -hmm. which for the rest of Bendis's run, he actually kind of dealt with that. Like, hmm. I shouldn't be back. I was supposed to make the sacrifice. This is what I was supposed to do. So hmm. it was like that regret of not dying, which I thought was really, really interesting. So that one affected me. Yeah, that's and, interesting. Yeah, that was my first um, legitimate. I'm going through. I'm reading the Avengers now. Uh, I yeah. never. I grew up not caring about the the Silver Age Avengers or the Golden Age Avengers, the Modern Age, whatever you want to call it. It just. The, I didn't like the George Perez stuff. Even when they came back after. Um, what was it after uh, Heroes? Heroes were boring. 
yeah, I tried it then. And I was like, nah, this isn't really for me. So uh, Ultimates was my first Avengers, but I don't know if that counts. And so the Bendis one in the 616 continuity was, oh shit, I'm, I'm actually reading the Avengers now. All right, yeah. this is what I do. That was a that was a really wild and it was like Avengers Assembled is only four issues, like it's a very quick. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it's almost insane how he was able to take four hundred and ninety seven issues of continuity and just fucking wipe the board. Yeah, yeah. which which felt made a like lot of a people death. mad. Oh, well, exactly. It, just, it felt like a death. It made a lot of people uh, upset. But Hawkeye was very much a pivotal point when I was reading it. Um, and the other one that's a tie for that, which I was also reading around the same time, was. Identity crisis. So Sue Dibney oh, uh, yeah. being killed. Yeah. yeah. I did not have. So just in the context of the story that I was reading, because a friend loaned it to me and we were reading it in issues. Um, it was really sad in context and really upsetting. And I really didn't like it. Then I went back and did, you know, the early 2000s version of research when you didn't have like all kinds of things at your fingertips. And I, I retroactively fell in love with Ralph and Sue. Uh -huh. So it was like experiencing it twice. And yeah. it was fucking awful. Yeah. I was yeah. like, this is awful. She doesn't deserve this. Yeah. It was yeah, it, it, really it, 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 bad. From comics, no. And then, yeah. And then, and then, like, I followed Ralph all the way mm. through it up and through, the, uh, like, it wasn't until 52 where they actually gave him closure with the death of mm -hmm. Sue. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is. Yeah. It was like a, it was like a five year journey. Yeah, and that and, was really effective. And her her death was one of those things that is one of those ones that um, resonated with so many people. But it wasn't so much because of how it was done. It was it was because that it was done? Yeah, because it mm -hmm. felt so unnecessary. Um, yeah. you know, uh, it. it it felt um, she was fridged. She was fridged basically in that whole yeah. storyline. And then to do that to that character who I don't think the writer had a true. Um, it was Brad Meltzer. Was, yeah. Brad, yeah. I don't think he had an appreciation for what she meant mm. to the, up uh, to her husband, you know, mm -hmm. now I guess there's a way of, you can argue that, okay, you're exploring that by exploring him dealing with the grief of her passing. And I thought that the stories that dealt with that were very, very touching. Very, I mean, almost heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't long after she died that they did a whole... Um, and it was supposed to get printed before then, but they did this whole return to the Wahaha Justice League um, oh, yeah. that had a lounge man and Sue yeah. right there, it, it, integral to the team as they were, and you got to see that whole dynamic, and you were like, "Yeah, this is what we're missing. Yeah, this is what we're yeah." I so I um, you can make a like yeah, I guess she was fridged. Because it was the it was the propulsion of the plot. However, I would make an argument in that story that it wasn't a direct fridging because it wasn't. It was almost like she was collateral damage yeah. to something bigger. Because if it wasn't Ralph's yeah. story, well, there Ralph was like Ralph was kind perfected. of fridged. Ralph was fridged too, in a way, yeah. in an emotional way, right? For, for the per, like this terrible thing happened to this wonderful couple to further the plot of yeah and it was it was you know if you've read the series it was something bigger with um like the what's what i like about identity crisis i don't know when the last time you guys read it is when it came the, out. the yeah. plot is is almost inconsequential to the to the uh, the to what happens? The emotional well, story. Well, yeah, the impact. well i mean i mean the the conflict is that there's a murder and a mystery hmm what really resonates outside of that is the larger implications that yes. people were violated mm -hmm. mm. Uh, mentally as well as physically violated. Yeah. Like the story yeah, just is about leave. that. The story no, yeah. is about that, not necessarily the murder mystery part. So it's, it sucks that like she was fridged almost in an inconsequential way, which made it more emotionally effective because tragedy happens randomly. Like yeah. when it's the bad guy who fight who goes after the girlfriend of the hero, that's fridging to make him like want to fight harder. This almost happened on the side because right. of choices that were made 
well before the series and it made it feel almost more real, made it feel almost more tragic. That's why it affected me. JD, just for people who are tuning in who may not realize some of the short term that we're using, give them the 30 second uh, definition of what fridging is. Mm. So oh, fridging, uh, having your girlfriend, fr- is it fridge the girlfriend or what's the, uh, it's what's the frig- whole term? Predominantly fridging. girlfriend, but fridging can apply to like any character is killed to motivate another character. It, 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 there you go. The so basically, yeah. yeah, when um Kyle Rayner first gets his Green Lantern ring and he, he's got a girlfriend named Alex and uh, he's just sort of a slacker. He's a graphic designer. Like me, he's he was me, but with a Green Lantern ring, uh, and he doesn't really have any sort of um, anything pro- uh, propelling him through life. He doesn't have any goals or anything. Um, he's sort of a, a lays about, and so basically, he comes home after fighting somebody, and he finds his girlfriend Alex has been murdered and stuffed inside, upside down inside his refrigerator. Um, so when a character, a, usually a female character, has been murdered by the writer solely in order to propel the male character forward that's called fridging yeah Yeah, it's 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 become over the years it's become a short term for lazy writing when you only have motivation from your main character because you kill off someone and and most especially their their partner or their significant other it's like a lazy device to get them to like go exact revenge or to become the next level like it's it's a it's a pretty shitty lazy write writing choice I remember reading in Wizard, Ron Mars, who wrote that issue, saying, like, right before it came out, he was like, uh, this is going to show that anything can happen in this comic. Like, we're getting rid of the main, the female love interest, anything can happen. And I remember thinking, like, that doesn't mean that at all. Like, it's just like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen. We're going to do this. We're going to do this guy. He's Batman. We're going to kill his parents. And that way you're going to know that anything can happen. Or after this event, nothing will ever be the same again. (laughs) And then after the next Ah, event. You will rock the universe to its core. (laughs) Uh, Comics are the best, guys. Go ahead, go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. Okay, so I just had another another example of uh, of uh, death. If you guys were interested, Um, do it. This was one. It was in Universe X, right? And (laughs) guys, and um, so it's in Universe X, and Captain Marvel um, is back. He he has died in the Marvel continuity like a long time ago, and he. but he's back from Earth X. He's like a kid. He's the only human left. And in Universe X, they're going around and collecting a bunch of uh, great power sources in the Marvel Universe. And and he needs to complete his cosmic consciousness so that they can like handle some really big problems, right? And it deals with the afterlife is a big part of it as well. And um, and there's a lot of a lot of heroes are there. And so one of the one of the pieces that he needs is the power cosmic from Norrin Rad, right? But he can't separate the two of them, right? So- Silver um, Surfer. So the Silver Surfer, right? And so he has to give up the power conflict, but also die in order to do that so that Captain Marvel can have, this is Marvel, the original one, um, so that he can have the all the pieces that he needs, right? So as he's walking into Marvel's cloak, he's, he's silver, and this is him dying and, and being absorbed. He's silver, and then he's back to looking like Norrin Rad, and he says, you know, tell me, the things we do here, do they matter? And Marvel says, because he knows of this world and the afterlife, and he says, you know, yes, they do. And he walks into the oh. darkness of the cloak. And I don't know, I'm not even sure that he says, yes, they do, but that's the, what I really remember is, tell me, these things we do here, do they matter? And then walks in. Um, so it was really effective. It's like an alternate universe story. It's not part of the continuity, but uh, that moment, the nobility and and uh, austere, you know, nature of it really hit me. Super nice. Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that brings me to one question before we we go um, afield and, and start bringing in other pop culture references into this but as far as with comics do you find yourself if you are moved by you know these scenes in the comics is it more so the writing and and thereby some 
to a degree the setting in which the person is passing or how much is it you know the art and the way it is depicted that speaks to you you know Ooh, there's a third factor too nothing about the story at all just who the character is you know and you're like oh what the <laughs> they got rid of this character. Yeah. Now. That's, a good, that's a good point. <laughs> you know? One of the ones that that actually I, I was just thinking about, and you know, I was talking about how much Tara's de death meant to me. But when I think about uh, chronologically, this was earlier. Was the first time that Jean Grey died uh, on the moon uh, in the blue area of the moon? Um, you know, when uh, fighting with the X Men, fighting the uh, uh, the um, the sh I want to call him Natal Shiar. I was going to call him Natal Shiar because yeah, I never had, realized that before. <laughs> we have a Star Trek, crew, but the the Imperial Guard. Every time they say Tal Shiar, I think so, Shiar. Uh, you fight the Imperial Guard, and um, she dies. And if you've ever read that original comic book from the eighties, it's it's a very memorable scene that almost everybody can you know almost now visualize because it's been re redone so many times but it's a very small panel in that book it's not like it's a splash page it's a very small panel in that comic book um yet she was a major character that died and so much so that then the following issue and i can't remember whether or not it was on the cover it was on like the immediate splash page were the x-men in black at the funeral and that always resonated with me because that was john byrne who was the hit artist at that time and as much as i felt for her passing it was definitely the art that got it over for me more so I, than anything else i uh, i can kind of relate in a weird way like and it's funny it, it was triggered because you mentioned gene gray so i never read the phoenix saga for the most part um so her initial death really didn't do anything for me or didn't affect me in any way. Right. Um, so in that way, it's like not necessarily the character, which she came back and all kinds of great stuff. Awesome. It's not necessarily the character, um, but I would, I would almost lean more towards uh, a mix of the character and the author, the writer, because I immediately thought of um, Grant Morrison's run in new X-Men when she's been around, she's been back for a while, but they has the whole like ending kind of future arc where Wolverine has to kill her while she's about to turn back into mm. the Phoenix force. And the, he's the only person that can, because he continually regenerates as she's like mm. killing everything else around her in these crazy blasts. So right. the, the scenario that Grant Morrison presented of the only person he's ever like Wolverine's ever loved, he has to go kill her for the rest of the world or for humanity and the act of doing so, he's constantly being bombarded with like soul crushing and or like murderous waves of energy. So he's constantly dying and regenerating and dying and regenerating just to end the life of somebody that he, you know, loves with all his heart. So Brutal. it's not her. It's not him. It's the scenario that the writer portrayed right. making it this intense, brutal like story that I remember more than, you know, hundreds of others. So can I think I, for me, it'd be the couple, artist or the writer. Go ahead. I just want to do a couple of, um, what would you call them? Uh, runner ups before we move on to not comics. Is it okay? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Glenn. I was uh, at the comic shop. List. I was at the comic shop eating lunch on the, the day that issue 100 came out of walking dead and I was there and I was eating my food and I was reading on my break. I'm like, oh, I wonder what this 100th issue. It's going to be crazy. Kirkman does some crazy shit. And I literally had to move my food. And I was like, I'm just going to, I can't eat anymore. I'm literally, I got literally sick to my stomach. First and only time a comic has emotionally and intestinally affected me. Yeah. Yeah. Only it was time. so disgusting. And like the little sounds he was making, I guess he was calling for Maggie or whatever. Oh man, it got me here and it got me here. Stomach and heart. Oh, and then my other one, my other one is Jesse Custer in Preacher. Okay. Okay. Oh man. And that, I believe, I, I'm trying to remember, Cassidy goes, right? The sun comes up, Cassidy explodes all over Jesse. And then they, I think they have a sniper and they boop him right in the, right in the, in between the eyes. And it says, 
the last panel of that issue, I think, is that was how they murdered him, covered in the ashes of his best friend. Mm. And I was just like, and then I had to wait for the next month to read the next issue, and it was <laughs> oh, got me. Mm. I yeah. need to reread Preacher now. Oh my god, so good. Should I? Should I okay, here, you know what? Off top, like kind of off topic. Should I reread it and then finally watch the show? Should I watch the show and then reread it? Because I still have it all the reread in my head. I've read. I've reread read, it. Reread it. You like I shouldn't watch the show and then reread it as opposed to do both. Yes, I was talking about order. Yeah, do both. Yeah, watch it and read it at the same time. <laughs> I'll yeah. play it and I'll only read the book while the show is on. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, that makes Perfect. sense. Perfect. Yeah. You know what you can do? Watch the show, mute it, put on a close captioning, and then you're watching and reading it at the same time. Oh my god! Oh. There you go. I feel like, it, well, I don't know. You're still not even done season, uh, season two of Star Trek Discovery. You're never going to finish the book, the series. Look. You read yeah. faster than you than you I watch do. movies is what I'm I saying. I do read faster more long, like that I watch shows, yeah. Oh, that's what I'm the, saying. JD's not the one to be going to about, you know, catching up and, and watching and reading stuff. <laughs> so, so don't be going yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> one here. yeah, you know what? You're not perfect. Why are you giving me advice? All right, yeah. No, before I don't. We, before we move off of comics, B, let me get one more from your list, and then we got a question from um, from Dom we're going to hit up, and then we're going to move into pop culture. Another comic? Oh, so you know what? There was one that was not so much emotionally effective of me, except in that it cut off a lot of these story possibilities. And I only say this, I, I was so upset about it because it was so good and it was the writer's own choice to do this with his character, but uh, Rick Remender's End League, uh, he introduces a guy named Astonish Man. And, all right. Uh, he introduces a guy named Astonish Man, who is a Superman analog type character. Right. And he is in the first issue and he, um, he's in the first issue. I assume JD is doing this because he, as a comic store owner who's shot by frequent has heard this story a number of times. <laughs> and <laughs> but, Noel has it in his, his pile and doesn't want to be spoiled. I got so go ahead. Are you done? No, not, no, no. Not uh, anyway, you still going? Yeah, I'll do this when I'm not when I'm done. Are you done? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So he um, he's the Superman type. He was uh, he got a little overconfident, and these aliens come in, and he uh, he this accident happens, right? And it mm -hmm. destroys like it kills so many people in the world, but a few that are left are uh, super are given superpowers, right? Mm -hmm. So now they're in this like pretty post-apocalyptic world with some people with powers, but he is the only shining light, the Superman type, that can like hold them up, but he feels so guilty. Nobody knows that he is responsible for all this. And he was like the most interesting new character created in like the last 10 years I said at the time. Wow. Wow. And then they killed him off in the second issue. And I was like, you know, he can't tell anyone that he's so guilty, but he's responsible for it. And it was just so interesting. But that's not the story he wanted to tell, you know. And yeah. the rest of it's still really good. Like it's still really interesting. So yeah. And then kudos to him that he still made the rest of it sell like that. Yeah. You know I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to pop culture, we got a we got a question from Dom. So I'm going to so I'm going to read it. Um, he asks, "Is there someone in the comic book business, whether or not they be a create creator or artist, whose death hit you the most?" And for the most, and I'm going to. For oh. now, take Stan Lee off the table. Okay. Um, he mentions Mark Grunewald because Mark Grunewald, as an editor at Marvel, had actually sent him a letter in Ooh. response to uh, a fan mail that he had sent to him. Can I answer this first? Go ahead. Like, uh, while you were going through the end league, because I do still want to read it someday, I was mm. cut off. As a joke, I went and grabbed um, my absolute preacher. Like, I'm going to start the reread now. <laughs> um, but in the lieu of that question, it's literally Steve Dillon. Oh yeah. Um, for some reason, and and I don't get emotionally affected too much when actors or 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 artists pass away because it, I I don't have an emotional connection to them like personally. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, there's some that happen, and I I, I get sad about never having never getting to see their work again. Right. 
and Steve Dillon definitely was one of them. Like I loved his work and it, it kind of petered out. Like he was much more selective towards the end. Um, and it's, I just, I, I find his work just simplistic, but beautiful at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mine is actually, uh, along those same, uh, kind of like those same lines is, um, Marshall Rogers, who was the like historic, uh, late seventies artist of Batman actually did a, a pretty cool short run on Dr. Strange too. That was pretty dope. A lot of people sleep on, um, he, he he's just e eternal to me as my favorite Batman artist of all time. He's the one that b b took his cape to life. Mm. He is the artist b b behind um, up to recently considered the best Joker story of all time, you know, with the Joker fish. Um, <laughs> he, he's the one that brought Silver St. Cloud. He's the one that made, he's the one, him and, uh, was it Lynn Wine? Uh, I believe it may have been Lynn Wine. Um, no, Steve Englehart. Him, him and Steve Englehart are the one that actually brought um, uh, Deadshot back into prominence in the 70s after he hadn't been used for almost 30 years. He's the one that gave him, you know, his first new uh, outfit. Costume oh, yeah. soon be iconic. Um, Floyd Lawton. Yeah, yeah. Thanks Marshall Rogers was, was a beast. He... he <laughs> He passed away far too soon. He he drew he drew the Batman comic strip in the newspaper as well. Um, he was he was just breathtaking. Like yeah, that, he hit me. It hit hits me hard. I still look at a lot of his art and just so well up. Uh, so I'm gonna try and tell this story as briefly as I can. Uh, Len, Len, you've already heard this one. <laughs> so uh, I had cancer um, quite a while ago. And afterwards, I was feeling down. I wasn't feeling very motivated to draw and all that sort of stuff. So um, after, after um, what was the funny thing? Anyway, uh, so after, um, after the cancer, I was feeling down. And Sushan, my now wife, says, hey, let's go for a drive. I got a present for you. I got a surprise. And I was like, oh, all right, neat, cool. Let's go for a drive. So we went for like probably about a two-hour drive. <laughs> and uh, we pull up in front of Joe Kubert's school for comic book creation. And uh, I, I said, what, what the, why are we here? She said, oh, we have, you know, you, you have an appointment with Joe Kubert. And I said, what do you mean I have an appointment with Joe Kubert? What are you, what are you, what are you talking about? She's like, yeah, we're going to go meet him. I'm like, what the, wh what, are you, why, what are you saying? Why, why am I meeting Joe Kubert? What am I going to say to him? She's like, I'm just talk to him. You're just going to talk to him. I'm like, what do you mean talk to Joe Cooper? What do you, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. Turn the car around. Why are we here? Uh, so yeah, we walked in and she said uh, she had, she emailed Joe Cooper and uh, pulled, pulled the cancer card. Basically is like, Hey, my buddy, my buddy JD's, you know, not feeling great cancer, blah, blah, blah. Would you mind talking to him? So uh, yeah. So she drove me the two hours to the Joe Cooper school. And we sat in his office and we chatted and we talked about comic book art. And I sat, yo, guys, I sat at his drafting table <laughs> with all of his brushes and pens and everything and all these sort of jewelry rigged situations. And I'm like, this is how you put your ink. Because, you know, you dip, you got your brush and you got your ink well. But if your table's like this, mm. how do you hold your, what do you do? You hold your ink? What do you do? What's the secret here? Turns out. He made a little thing out of um, like styrofoam, like um, yeah. kind of like cardboard. Uh, what's it called? Um, foam core. Uh, foam core. Uh, and he made a little hole, and then it was duct taped to his uh, yeah. thing to hold the the brush. Uh, I'm sorry, the the inkwell upright. Nice. No matter, even though his his table's like this. Anyway, so uh, yeah, it was beautiful. And on the ride home, you know, he gave me all this beautiful, wonderful advice. And he just, it was just a, a wonderful man. And he talked to me for longer than he had any. I had any right to expect him to talk to me. Hmm. And on the way home, I, I said to my wife, I was contemplative and I was just sort of sitting and thinking and getting emotional. I said, so that must be what it's like to have a dad. Uh, Cause just the way he talked to me and gave me advice and everything it was, it was moving, moving and beautiful. And it was a great experience. And uh, yeah, I was super bummed when uh, he split, but. Can you give a, can you give anybody that's listening a primer? Because I feel like Joe Kubert is not talked about as much as Kirby and and Lee are. Who is Joe Kubert? Yeah, man. Yeah, Joe Kubert is a uh, art. Well, I, I think Len 
Len, probably. Do you want to take it? Oh, Joe Kubert is a historic um, comic book artist dating all the way back to the time of of Kirby. Um, started not yeah. long after him uh, in, in the 40s. Um, huge uh, army. Uh, um, Sergeant artist. Rock, right? Yeah, yep. Sergeant Rock. Yep. I've got Sergeant a Sergeant Rock, Rock uh, pint glass downstairs from Joe yeah. Kubert. Yeah, I mean, he drew Sergeant Rock for years, man. He historically did not care about superheroes too much, even mm -hmm. though he did some mm -hmm. historic runs on, like, Hawkman, and mm -hmm. I think he drew some, like, Adam Strange stuff. Um, but a longtime DC DC artist um, and, and cover layout. And then more, even more historically, and talking about legacy, um, not only does he give us his two sons, Adam and Andy Kubert, who are mm -hmm. renowned artists and um, almost – equally Hall of Fame artists in, in yeah. the same ranks of, his, of their father. But then he creates the first, and to my mind, I believe still the only school dedicated to comic book artistry. It's the Joe Kubert mm. School of Comic Book Art, um, where, it, and I think he started this like in the early, in the mid 70s. 70s, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, and, it, and it, it was just that, where, people could go and learn how to become comic book artists. Because there's one thing about becoming an artist and a painter and all that type of stuff, but becoming a comic book artist, becoming a storyteller within the realm is a totally different skill. And it's a mm -hmm. skill that you can take almost any place because in there it built out into into the writing into the art into the inking and the coloring and it also that built into the storyboards and everything like that and he was the creator he was the master the, the man who said this is what is necessary you know not mm -hmm. just going to the conventions and yeah. reviewing people's portfolios no there needs to be a school and and that's his legacy yeah. and it, it is still holds yeah this day. In investing in the artistry of of just panel or of, of comic book artistry. It's completely different than other kinds of illustrations. And I, I think that the the subtle brilliance of, of comic books and like reading comic books, I think is is in that, that it is so, um, it's complex, but simple at the same time. So when you're experiencing, it seems like it's no big deal or it seems like it's it's very breezy and it's simple, but there's so much work behind the scenes of trying to, make static mm. image feel as though they are motion, mm. that it's it's inherently beautiful in, mm. in its simplicity. And and yes, Joe Kubert is is a forefront of kind of wanting to teach that and imbue that into other generations, mm. which makes him immortal. I love watching him draw, man. Just sitting and watching him oh, yeah. go from, uh, you know, noodly kind of lay, uh, layout uh, uh, thumbnails and then um, laying down the ink, he just lays down ink like it's nothing. Like just boop, 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 boop. Oh, look, there's Hawkman. Fuck me. Where'd he come from? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's great. Uh, I love him. Yeah. Like yeah. when you go to these comic book conventions, people, when they do return and they will return, um, as you're walking through your artist alleys and everything like that, and you're buying your, the, the latest and the greatest, yeah, you, you, you see some of these, these gray beards there. Stop in, talk to them, man, because that's the yeah. one right there. That's the legend. That's the legacy. That's that's the building blocks of this industry and this culture that we love right there. And there are not that many around anymore. Um, so, mm -hmm. like, like step to them, talk, and they love that. Yeah. They love sharing. Yeah. Sharing mm -hmm. the stories, man. All right, let's let's move on to it wider into into pop culture. Um, because fictitious deaths, the, the, those definitely resonate. I understand it, B, most of yours are from comic books, and that's fine. Um, uh, and, and if you still want to tell a few, that's, that's, that's cool. Um, but I think, it, just like Noel was saying, you know, there's something about the moving image mm. that really can, be, like, really, like, really, really strike you. Um, one of the one of the most resonant deaths and probably the most is one I've only ever seen once and will only see once besides, huh. besides the page in walking dead 100, which I've never seen since I read that one. I, I sp specifically turned like three pages past that when I reread. <laughs> <Walking Dead>. um, <laughs> I throw the book into the other <laughs> corner. Cause I can't take this. <laughs> yeah, can't later, I'll pick it up. Randomly, yeah. Um, but the one death that really hits me is from um, Tim Burton's film, Big Fish. 
which huh. is, uh, tells the story of did you did you not see Big Fish, um, JD? I know you see Big Fish. I saw it back in the theater, and I was like, that that was fine. Oh, it was so. It's 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 like this fantasy. It's about this like this this guy um, played by Albert Finney, who's kind of like this traveling salesman. Edward Bloom. Edward Bloom. Yeah, right. His name is Edward Bloom. The character's name is Edward Bloom, um, and he's he's just lived this wild life, wild life, and he tells his life story um, to Billy Crudup in the in the in the um, in the film, and then the, most of the film is. Is flashbacks to him younger, played by Ewan McGregor, and uh, it's 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 a beautiful film. I'm hit or miss with Tim Burton. Um, the imagery always takes you away. The stories sometimes leave me a little cold. Yeah. This one hit me, and it, 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 yo, know, it hit me because it was literally the month that my father was was leaving us. Oh. Um, and I watched that film. I bought like a baby from like 15 minutes in till the end. Um, and then when it came out on video, I, I bought it. And, and by the time it came out on video, my father had passed. Mm -hmm. And this film just brought me, hit me in my feelings about my, my relationship with my father, who I had a good relationship with. But I think... I'm not alone in that sometimes the relationship we had, it's not the relationship that we want. Mm. We, we, in many ways, we mm. wanted to be so much more. And especially after they're here, you think about all the opportunities you had to have made it so much more. And it didn't, it, it, it always strikes me that after my pop, my pop left, that all of my dreams of my father are me and him fishing alone together hmm. in a boat. Me and my dad never went fishing alone on a boat once. We went fishing <laughs> together once with about five other guys deep sea fishing, but me, we never went fishing alone together. Um, but the scenery of it was very reminiscent of some of the scenes in, in Big Fish. Hmm. So when I bought the DVD, I put it in the DVD player, I turned it on, it came on with like the menu screen and I sat there and watched that menu screen for two hours. Hmm. I, I didn't, I didn't cry, but I was just reminiscing on my father again. And I said, you know what? I'm glad I have this film, but I don't need to watch you. You know, hmm. I, j just having you is enough. Mm, I want to hug you. I want to hug you because there's a couple of things in there. First of all, everybody, everybody joining us, welcome to the Big Fish podcast. Uh, we're here <laughs> to talk about Big Fish for the next two and a half hours. Um, it is a movie about fathers and sons, so that makes it um, it makes it very acute and specific. Mm -hmm. However, more so than that, it's a movie about the the strength of storytelling. Ooh. Because what you what you didn't mention is that you're seeing this other person's life through the lens of the stories that he tells his son and the stories he tells his son are ridiculously uh, exaggerated, right. like off the mark. Um, and the point, like at the end of the movie, when he does finally pass away, um, he is in his deathbed with it. Has anybody spoilers? Are we okay? Has anybody seen it? No, um, when he's on his deathbed with his son, who, who is, incredibly frustrated with him because he doesn't feel like he knows his father because all he tells him is there are these, these wild stories, wild stories as in his dying breath is to ask him, what's the story of my death? Like we're living it now. What's the story of my death? We're living it now. He's like, no, what's the story of my death? And the whole last sequence is the son finally realizing that it's really the art of telling the story is how you connect to each other. So he, with his father, creates this wild story about how they jump out of the bed and they go do this and they go do that and they see all these yeah. people and I lay you down in the, in the water and you become a big fish in a small pond like you always were meant to be. It's For me, it wasn't just the father and son, which is very acute, but it's also the strength of storytelling how amazing it could be when you're trying to connect with somebody that you can't say the words for. That's what makes Big Fish so fucking good. Mm. I saw it in the theater, and uh, I have had a, a long 
back and forth with my emotions about my father. Uh, and this may have struck me at a time where I was like, <laughs> fuck that guy. Um, so uh, I just, yeah, I remember seeing a theater and being like, my, the main takeaway was I was really looking forward to all of the big, crazy um, visuals that Tim Burton is known for. And it felt very reserved when it mm. came to the, the visual effects mm. and everything. And I was just like, Oh, that was just like a regular, that could have been very directed by anybody, not Tim Burton. Mm. Um, so I was a little disappointed by that. And uh, that's sort of what all oh, I took away from it. Really. I, I just must've been in a, a bad father spot at that point. Hey, it happened. Totally fair. Totally fair. Yeah. Totally it's fair. a very weird movie. Yeah. Uh, I got one. Go. It's the same one that was mentioned earlier by action figure expert who said, I was a little upset when Optimus Prime died. Mm. Uh, yeah. In the 1980s animated film, uh, which was in theaters, there's a whole thing. There's a final showdown between Optimus Prime and, um, Megatron yeah, and uh, Optimus, he gets it and he's on the table there and he's, he's dying and there's nothing they could do. And all of a sudden he dies and his head turns and he turn everything, just all the color drains out of him and he becomes all monochrome gray. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Did that get me? That mm. got me. I couldn't believe it. Mm. That got everybody, man. Well, um, man. Was that movie in theaters first? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Dude. When everybody, because Transformers hit like, like there's few cartoons that I remember hitting as hard as Transformers did. Mm. And as mm. much as everybody heralds He-Man and everybody was a big He-Man fan, Transformers hit harder yeah. Oh, yeah. because yeah. Transformers was what it was. It was the giant robots. It was like this. It was like this American anime robots good animation and everything like that and deep resonance and he man was just like a big puffed up steroid little blonde <laughs> you know what i'm saying but transformer just hits like thunderstruck mm -hmm. and then when you saw the commercials for the movie with the music you were like yo i am there you were there in line you had to be you yeah. had to be because that was all you were talking about for the rest of the week transformers <laughs> the movie and then when you saw optimus prime die you were like wait a minute the movie's over and he's dead what is this bullshit no 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 no, no. and then and then not only does optimus die but megatron gets resurrected as a completely different bullshit character called Galvatron. Yeah. Yes! Gotta have a bad guy. It galvanized the nation is what it did. It did. I mean, you didn't love Hot Rod as much as, or, sorry, Rodimus Prime. I did Prime like Hot Rod. As much as, uh, it's Rodimus Prime. Rodimus you didn't, Prime. Oh, Not forever. <laughs> you didn't love Rodimus Prime as much as Optimus Prime? No. No. Uh, Judd Nelson, no. great work. Not much of a Rodimus. As you are an optimist. A rotomist. Ah! Nice. No, no. This is like when Sergeant Slaughter all of a sudden became the head of G.I. Joe instead of Duke. Get the fuck out of yeah. here. But he, what happens with Rodimus when, because, you know, Optimus, we all know what happens. <laughs> I, I was worried that I, because we're going to uh, talk about resurrections too, I think, right? So yeah. I don't know if that's also one of your resurrections. Um, no. It, what happens with Rodimus? Uh, like, because Optimus Prime comes back, right? Is it just like, all right, take it easy, Ra? I don't remember. Yeah, nobody knows. I never nobody thought knows. about it, but until right now, but I don't yeah. think I spent much time in the in the Transformers universe after the movie. Oh well, he does come back, JD. There's a pit of lava yeah. involved, I think, or maybe I that's think, well, but if I remember correctly, Rodimus Prime actually went was on a very special um, episode of Family Matters and walked up the stairs with the little yeah. girl. Yeah. And then you just never saw her again. Never saw her again. I think you're wrong because as we all recall, that was not a very special episode of Family Matters. Throwaway episode of Family Matters. <laughs> Dom says, I can't talk about Prime dying, man. No shame. I was balling in the theater when I saw that. Uh, and also, Rodimus Prime was a good character. He says, "I, I don't doubt that. It's just um, I, my my uh, my experience with opt or with Transformers kind of begins and ends with the movie. Uh, I watched the show here and there 
Uh, but I was young, so like I rem I I actually explicitly remember the blockbuster video where I was able to find a copy of the Transformers <laughs> movie, and we rented it every single weekend. But when it comes to following up past the movie, mm. yeah. Oh, Rodimus good. became co-leader of the Autobots with Optimus at the end of season four. And I guess they shared the what was it? The spark of yeah, it's called the Matrix of Leadership. The Matrix leadership. Of leadership. Get your shit together, Brian. Man, Ooh, go to sleep and wake up smarter. What, what Matrix yeah. of Leadership? Yeah, you guys. Shit. They have I know somebody who doesn't got the touch. Who doesn't got the power? Oh, I've got the touch, JT. I've got the power. <laughs> That's a threat, and you need to calm down. <laughs> so no, so no, I don't, you don't have to like you know piggyback off a of big fish. And you were talking, you started talking about how movies and moving images mean so much. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, uh, I got I, I wrote down a couple before this, and I realized after writing down a couple, some of them were a little dumb, and then some of them were like really lumped together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like everybody's got Mufasa. Everyone's got like Jenny and. Forrest Gump. So like those are those are obvious. So, like ones that were like a little bit more genre I tried to focus on. And I realized in the television Buffy verse, there's at least three deaths mm. that hurt my heart mm. so so much. Mm. So I'll Go start on. I'll start in chronological, chronological order. Mm. Okay. The first one being the season five episode, The Body, where Joyce yeah. Buffy's mom. Yeah. Dies of a brain aneurysm. Mm. Just does. Oh, it's so good. Because life happens Mommy. outside of supernatural shit. And that was so crushing. So, like, I remember, too, like, the episode before that episode where she is passed away. All of it gets resolved with whatever big bad they're fighting. And all of a sudden, she just, like, the last, the coda of the whole episode is she goes home. And all you see in the, the living room is the feet of her mom. Yeah. She's on the ground. Mm -hmm. And you're like, and it's a, you know, it's a cliffhanger. So you're like, what the fuck? The next episode, she's dead. And then the whole, the entire episode is the medical, like just the normal medical response to someone suffering a brain aneurysm. So like in the middle of this very far-fetched supernatural television show about vampires and demons, someone just passes away from natural causes. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very difficult to kind of, wrap your head around yeah, yeah and it was very effective so that's the first one one of my favorite parts one of my favorite parts about that is uh you have a pov shot of buffy who is talking to a police officer i believe who has come in you know uh, a paramedic or something and they're sort of relaying the information to buffy but the character is taller than buffy so buffy's here the character's up here but mm. they show you buffy's pov which is this Mm. Yeah. Mm. If so he's back, telling her, but yep. but all you see is the guy's chest. If mm. you go back and watch that not... episode, yeah, you, no, you're absolutely right. Every single like all of the static shots of that episode are things slightly out of frame to kind of show the the surreal nature of of human tragedy. So mm. like so good. at the very end of the episode, her and her sister um finally like they're they're convinced the whole episode that it's some sort of Machiavellian plot from some sort of demon. Mm. They finally get to the body and to make sure that it's real and really her, like, you know, reaching out to touch her foot and then it fades to black. Oh, mm. it's so good. It's one of the best episodes of television I've ever seen. And it's actually very emotional, effective, but 100, 100%. Um, staying in that kind of arena um, in season six. Anybody, are, did we all watch Buffy? Am I going to spoil it for everybody? Um, I, I'm, I didn't watch Buffy, but I, I'm, I'm with it, though. I'm with you. In the middle of this, uh, towards the end of season six, when Tara just gets shot. Yeah. yeah. She gets, like, she gets, and she doesn't get shot intentionally. She gets shot by a stray bullet. Yeah. It's, it's in, in, in these shows, these, and this is what made Whedon so great. The fact that, like, in these very supernatural, crazy shows, every once in a blue moon, there would be something very pedestrian that happens mm. that they can't make a spell over or do a ritual for or fight. Like it's a possession, like real things, like a piece of metal shot at a high velocity through her chest. That wasn't the, best thing, her. the thing about that one is 
Tara and Willow are upstairs. They're upstairs in the yeah. bedroom. Yeah. And Buffy is, I believe, out in the backyard and she's dealing with uh, one of the three geeks or whatever. And he runs away. And he, I think he's like running and just kind of shooting backwards at her. Yeah, he and gets, the bullet he gets goes, Buffy. Oh, yeah, he gets her? I forgot. He gets Buffy. Yeah. And then he just like shooting, running away. One stray bullet goes into the building, at the, the, yeah. the second floor, while Willow and Tara, a couple who are madly in love with each other and just made up, are talking to each other like, oh, hey, yeah, what should we do today? And all you see is a splatter of blood on Willow's face because yeah. Tara was just shot by a stray bullet. And what does, she, what does she say? Does she say someone, I think, doesn't someone say my dress or something? Uh, yeah, it's something really good. She looks down and she goes, oh, my dress. Yeah, she's got a bullet hole right in her chest. It's oh, brutal. It's super brutal. And, and like the entire episode is about getting um, Buffy care because she was all she was shot, and that's the only all the main characters only know that Buffy was shot because that's what happened in the foreground. In the background, Willow is holding her, you know, betrothed dead body and going insane. That was oh, it's so good. But then the the third one is in Angel many seasons later when <gasps> Winifred. Fred! Oh, Fred. Oh. oh, that was so horrible. Go on, I'm sorry. No, I mean, I, I feel like your reactions are appropriate. Oh, I and, forgot. Oh, that was one Fred, really, like, this character is so awesome. That was, mm -hmm. that fell into that category. Fred was my favorite. So yeah. that emotionally affected me yeah. for many episodes because not only did she yeah. die, mm. her body was inhabited by an awful thing for the rest a of the series. A demon or something, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, a demon god. No. Illyria? Illyria. Illyria, yeah. Ah! Yeah. Oh. yeah. But, well, also, isn't she the she's in the middle of a song, isn't she, Noel? She was, well, um, she she got infected with the thingy and then uh, yeah. collapsed uh, when um, w uh, Wesley was about to, like, kind of put the moves on her again. Well, I think, I think they're both her. walking up the steps. Right, they're walking that's up the steps, she, and he's behind her. That's when she first kind of comes, like uh, over, uh, has to come to it. That's when she first. Oh, to it. she like but spits she, blood she on his die. face. Yeah, she doesn't die yeah, until okay. later, and he's holding her, and they're they're singing a song to each other, and it's going to be okay. And she, it's one of those classic television things where it's just like, I'll be okay, I'll be, <laughs> and it's just so fucking creepy. And then immediately she wakes up as this nasty thing, and then it's a you know next yeah. week. And that I kept was, waiting. I kept waiting for her to come back into her body, and she never does. She's always been Illyria ever since, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. Fred died. Period. Fred yeah, is dead. That's a, yeah. So it, was, it was this weird cognitive uh, cognitive dissonance of the actor still has work, and they're still there. Hmm. That is not Fred. And, yeah, I like her. I'm glad she's around. Yeah. Yeah. It was th those three deaths. I'm were sorry. Oh, so, yeah. Rip your throat out, and it was all in the Buffy verse. Now, I'm, I'm I'm curious because you know the Buffy verse. Um, what do you think? What do you think was so special about Buffy that you know um, TV series? You're lucky if you got one death or, or that re really resonates with you. And there was three through this one. Now, m mind you, it was a show that lasted a few seasons, but still. Oh, I'm going to answer that question, but also I'm going to add one a fourth one, if I may. And that's uh, Firefly. That's Wash mm. in Firefly. Wow. Okay. He's a leaf right. on the and wind. It's in Serenity. Uh, she's the best thing in that show. What I say, Serenity, the movie. It's, it's yeah, he's the best. Yeah. Absolutely, the best thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's so secondary. good. But yeah. there, that's those Joss Whedon shows were some of my favorite television shows because the writing was so on point. Uh, he liked to pull the rug out from under you when you least expected it, but he did it in such a way that was believable and heartbreaking. And the some of the choices, uh, you know, he makes as a director when he's filming those things, like I said earlier about only showing her POV where she's not even looking at the face of the person who's talking to her because her mother is dead. Mm -hmm. It's it's stuff like that. I believe in that scene, there's also, I'm sorry, in that episode, there's no music. Mm. So he, he makes um, these decisions to drive home the point to the audience, the... Um, you know, the devastation of what's just occurred. And there's just, there's something about the way he does stuff that I really like. Not so much maybe Avengers 2, but like his TV show stuff was <laughs> well, uh, some of my favorite. You know I would, I would, I would argue too, like uh, um, in our lifetimes, at least up until the Josh Whedon shows, which 
dates back to what mid nineties. Yeah. There was no genre television at the time. And, and honestly too, a lot of genre popular fiction that was writing at the level of that, like actually writing, uh, there's a type of writing that asks the viewer to um, understand that level as opposed to talk at them or down to them. A lot of popular fiction and a lot of like genre stuff, especially was always talking down to you. Like, you know, the tropes it's cheesy cause it's cheesy. This took yeah. cheesy. A lot of it was, yeah. I mean, we just read JLA Avengers and a lot of it's talking at me. That shit was awesome. <laughs> it's, it's <talking laughs> at me. But for, for, for those kinds of genres, they were always um, thought of as the other, or it's no big deal because it's vampires. Who cares? It's fine. Mm. Whereas they took it seriously and they they made it what it's supposed to be. Fiction is supposed to be an allegory for something in real life. So the idea of high school is hell. Let's make it actually hell, and mm. let's write it as it's a real thing. Let's let's actually take time and effort. So like with those shows specifically, they elevated the genre by taking extra care with it and actually writing into it as opposed to down to it or, or like, it's just a trope. That stuff is, is still fantastic. No matter what they've done since. I keep wanting to go back and just do an, a whole rewatch of Buffy and angel. Yeah. I'm in. Yeah. Um, Oh, go, go, go. You no, um, I had, a, I was going to say, I, I thought they were going to do a, uh, I'd heard that they were going to do a spike and like, Eliza Dushku's character spinoff after that, and they did, but yeah, Faith, right? Um, so I have one. This is like a kind of death, and I I know I've read things, but I cannot remember any, and it's poignant. But it takes place at the end of the universe, right? And I've always found that, like in History of the Marvel Universe, that just came out with Franklin Richards at the end of the universe, right? That kind of thing where it's all of reality is ending. Mm -hmm. That has always got me. You know what I mean? It's the the finality, the again, the austerity of it, the I don't know. It's stark and um interesting to me. The end of all things is always uh quite the stakes. It yeah. is quite the stakes. And there's a certain, you know, whether or not in real life it is inevitable, when it's in a story, it's inevitable, you know. Right. Uh, Wait, hold, hold on, JD. Are you actually opening that? I'm opening it. I'm gonna, it's that mine. means that means you want it to be yours, as opposed to it's like mine. I might sell this, so I'm gonna leave it alone. Here it is. Oh. Yeah, I, I did it. it. I opened yeah. it. It's open. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, I through it. Yeah. Also, what dreams may come? Uh, Ooh, good oh. one. Oh. Yeah. A lot of that was about the afterlife. But um, in the beginning, uh, when the kids, when there's that car accident, it's so sad. Um, so, oh, really? Yeah. And, but in a way, you know, that one is predominantly takes place in in another world where these people go. So it's uh, among the many kinds of stories, genre stories, especially where it is known that there is an afterlife. There is a different sort of sense to death mm -hmm. in that kind of story. Um but so that in some ways counts and in other ways. Uh, well, in that story, it was more about um, loss than it was about death. So even when the characters died, it was they're now lost and they need to be uh, found. Yeah. yeah. Like that, that's, a, that's a really fun yeah. story. It's good. I'm sorry, it's someone good. just commented, Jason Todd deserved it. <laughs> that was <laughs> Jeremy Pierce. Wait, wait. Someone oh, Jeremy Pierce. He's a, he's a subscriber at the Hero Complex. Oh, very good, very good. Pretty dope. And uh, someone, I think Dom was mentioning about when Edith Bunker passed away on Archie Bunker, possibly uh, dating himself or on all in the family. Actually, mm -hmm. um, the, the the thing thing about that is that uh, Edith Bunker, while she, the character did pass away, you don't see it on the show because oh. it was strictly because the actress Jean Stapleton oh. um, had left the show and. Her character passed away. I think that was the impetus for the show becoming Archie Bunker's place. Wait, was she still oh. alive? The actress was alive. Oh yeah, yeah, she was still alive. She still lived for more than a few few years after that. She was just oh, tired right. of doing a character. Oh, I see. Oh. Yeah. Done it done yeah. long enough. She was like, you know what? Nah, I'm good. I mean, that level of vocal fry, no more. Like, yeah, right. Never, never again. Yeah. <laughs> um, do we have more coming, or can I do a couple of like little quick ones? Go ahead. 
All right. So uh, a couple that I wrote down: Ellen Ripley in Alien Three. Oh, okay. Okay. That's is that the one where she jumps into the molten lava? Yeah. Yeah. I, but she's by got an alien. Of... Go ahead. She's got an alien in her chest, right. and so she decides she's going to kill herself before the alien can uh, come out of her chest. And Ooh. so she jumps. She does like this backwards into the lava pit or whatever the hell it was. Yeah. And as she's falling, it climbs out of her chest and tries to escape. And she holds it mm. and takes it with her. Into mm. I thought that was awesome. Mm. Um, it's all that's tied. It's up there with the the Terminator Two. <laughs> um, <laughs> speaking of lava. Terminator 2, where he willingly sacrifices himself and he gives it the thumbs up. Can yeah. I throw one in? And then, throw... Oh, wait, you go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, uh, I was just going to say Artax. Who's that? From Never Ending Story. Uh, yeah. Artax I couldn't do it. Oh, no? right. Nobody? Yeah, where he's, uh, he's yeah. like in the quicksand. Yeah. yeah. They've been advertising Never Ending Story on like the Fire Sticks uh, screensavers. Oh, recently. really? Yeah, yeah. Hey. I've been thinking about it. Nobody, nobody, nobody on this uh, channel cares about Artex being like not caring enough and dying. Well, that that was a nightmare for me. I stopped watching it after that. That's, that's actually true. After it's the, a very after, nightmarish movie. I don't remember yeah, it. Yeah, after the horse goes, I was like, I'm out. Fuck this. I can't horse do it. It clearly did affect you a great deal. So you, so you didn't get to the Luck Dragon. Okay, cool. You know what? Someday yeah. we'll get there. You know what? Like never, um, in, never in the story. It was like. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'll Princess Bride, Princess Bride, <laughs> Princess Bride, and Labyrinth. Ooh, that was a good movie. I can't. I mean, yeah. Yeah. both of those movies are oh. better than Never Ending Story. However, the death of Artax is actually like a core memory of mm. loss in my young brain. Mm. Yeah. Uh, another one on my list is um, oh, Gwyneth Paltrow in Seven. Oh, I never saw that. Oh. What's in oh, the, the box? box. Wait, hang on. I know it's in the box. <laughs> uh, we just Wait, watched. What? Well, I was going to say, like, if he's never seen it. I've heard it before. Yeah. Like, it's been a long time. Yeah. Everybody knows what's in the yeah. box. We yeah. watched yeah. We watched Inside Out for the first time last night. So Bing Bong was a really hor horrible uh, experience. Bing Bong! Yo, we could do an episode about the fictitious deaths of Pixar movies. In Pixar movies. <laughs> yeah. Because there's another, there's a father son scene in Onward that hit me a little. Oh, bit I haven't seen it field. yet. Yeah, that's on Disney Plus. Oh, uh, we haven't watched Onward yet. Yeah, I'm gonna. I gotta watch that. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh, the up. first 15 minutes of up with Ellie. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Ooh, I have a, that's a real quick one. Uh, yeah. Whichever Weasley twin, and I, I don't remember Fred. which one it was. Fred. Ah, uh, for whatever reason, I was like, ah. Uh. Uh, a friend of mine at the time, you know, it was like that one. A lot of people died in that book, but him, if he, if he had survived, eh, the other ones would have yeah. been, fine. you know. Ha. It felt like for whatever reason, you know, they were just so well matched, or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dom says labyrinth was the spit. It was the spit. It was the yeah. spit. Yeah. Noel has left the building. Noel's out. <laughs> I, I, I Sam told me that Sam was was. The, you got anything, Sam? Me out. Hey, Sam. He went to go pee, so um, I'm here. What? What's your? Uh, do you have a, a death in pop culture that affected you the most? Um, well, Infinity War, I think. Um, you know. Ah. I I think it was Infinity War. Half of the universe. Yeah, that was pretty upsetting. Um, yeah. but but Endgame too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know the opening with um. Ah. Oh. Hawkeye's family. Yeah, Hawkeye and his family. That just I just started crying immensely immediately during that. Yeah. Um yeah. and I remember. And yeah, that 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 stands out as the most recent. Um mm. and then despite um this happening every time, um I don't know if you're familiar with Doctor Who. Uh, um, yeah. Oh boy. I see it. Um but uh <laughs> Doctor Who is uh is Keep great it but it it tends to, uh, so everybody knows that the doctor has to regenerate. And so that's a fact. But when Matt Smith de uh, regenerated as the 11th doctor, I I couldn't be consoled. I was very upset that he was done. And this was it for, for his his run of the doctor. Um, not just that, but his companions, because the doctor has bad luck with losing companions if you follow the series. Yeah, um, that, yes. So the pawns, that upset me a lot. Mm. So. Yeah. Did you see that there is a thing that Neil Gaiman wrote that um, 
Arthur Darville filmed in the character of Rory that's like uh, right after their final appearance. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. It just happened like last week. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Let's check that out. I was thinking of the 10th Doctor when we were making this list. Yeah, when you said, please, yeah, yeah. I'm not ready to go yet. And it's like, <gasps> yeah, yeah. Like, it's not dying, but it feels like it. It does. Yeah. There was there was another one that really got me, and I wasn't expecting it to. Uh, Saving Private Ryan. I've oh, only seen it the once in the theater. And uh, what? He's not on mic, so don't pay attention. Keep going. Oh, but basically, uh, there's a sequence between I think two just soldiers in mm -hmm. um, Saving Private Ryan, and they're in they're in the upstairs of uh, of a building, and I believe the one character lets the other one live earlier in the film. Yes, and then yeah, that character true. who he let live comes back, and they're wrestling with a knife, and the 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 guy who he let live is on top and he's slowly pressing the knife into this guy's chest yes. and he's just begging him like he knows he's going to lose this fight yes. and this the knife is just slowly sinking into his chest and he's begging him not to kill him and he just and he he goes it's it was so awful and what makes that, what oh. makes that stand out so much and I'll let you go B is that that character that's being killed more or less acts as the audience surrogate in that movie from the mm. moment that he comes in because he's based, he's he's the writer who they just they just need mm. bodies as they go looking for private Ryan. That's right. You know what I mean? So th which is why he was so sympathetic and let that that um that German live and for that German he recognizes him. Is it not like he's looking at another guy in a helmet? The dude doesn't have his helmet on. He, he's like, "Yo, it's me," and he's he's and he's still with absolutely no mercy. I remember. Him out. I remember seeing that in the theater too. That was the, that was the main death, that was the most disturbing. Even though we saw, rows and rows of human beings get decapitated and destroyed mm. on beaches, like, up until that point in the movie, the mm. slow, the slow knife. Yeah. yeah, into his chest was was very effective. Like, yeah, it, it, that stuck with me to this day. I still think about it. The German character is also shushing the guy yeah. that he's killing in like a comforting way, but like this is happening. This is going to happen. But yeah, just take it. Yeah. Oh, and, oh I hate it. And Tom uh, Hanks in that movie was pretty yeah. was pretty effective as well. I keep meaning to go back and rewatch that. Action figure expert says actually the German that killed the American character was a different character from earlier in the movie. Hmm. I, I don't remember it that yeah, way. Yeah. If he says he says it is, I'm not going to. Yeah, I remember it being the guy he let go. But it's it's, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Um, hmm. What about and... Bubba Gump guy from Forrest? Gump? I was just thinking about him. <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's a Kalatai Williamson. Yeah, he can boil it, saute or even, or not even, even not even him. When um, what what's uh oh my god, uh Jenny Gary Sinise, Gary Sinise character. Uh, oh, he lived. Lieutenant Dan is alive. He's still okay. No, he's remember still right he, here. He throws, he throws. Oh, oh, I'm about to say yeah, because <laughs> he's not because he dies in the movie. No, he doesn't. Lieutenant Dan's got space legs. He's alive. No. He's fine. Yeah, okay. There's no such thing as space legs when you have He's no left. legs and you throw yourself off the boat. No. <laughs> that's okay. Oh, no. He doesn't kill himself. He just goes swimming. It's not. He's alive. He's alive. <laughs> Lieutenant Dan's alive. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, I was, I've got another one. I just, um, thought, I just thought of one. If you want to go back to the emotional 90s that were Dawson's Creek. Actually, the, the, the finale. So when Jen... Dies. Mm -hmm. Who was Jen? Up? Died. Yeah, I didn't know that. She died, what and she it, was, it was like cancer or something. And it was really slow oh. and tragic. And she had a moment to say goodbye to literally everyone. And you're like <gasps> sobbing. And at least I was, you know, because I was watching that show every single Wednesday night. I was too. Um, and uh, it was. You know, in the beginning, when you first meet Jen in Dawson's Creek, you really don't like her. You're like, "Ooh, she's gonna steal Dawson and 
Blah, 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 blah. Nobody Mich- likes her. It's like Michelle you know, Williams, by the way. Michelle Williams. Yeah. And yeah. When she, in the beginning, you don't like her. You want to hate her. And then you grow to love her, especially toward the end of the series. Mm-hmm. And when she dies and she has a child, oh my God, it's awful. Uh, yeah, the, the, the finale of that show, wasn't it supposed to be, it was like a TV movie and it was years and years later. Yeah, it was supposed to be set in the future. Um, you know, Joey's a an editor for a magazine and Casey's a chef and anyway. (laughs) Uh, We did just, we did just finish the first season of Star Trek Discovery. Amazing. There is a, there is a death that we're very, we're still very fucking upset about. Yeah. I don't like that. And it was very sudden. Didn't, I was not prepared for that. Mm. And we're talking about the, Mm mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Why would you have, that actor and kill them without them having their own episode. And then there was hope. You had this hope. That actor, I thought he was familiar. Culver, Ricky. It's the guy from, yeah. Uh, My So Called Life. Something Cruise. My So Called Life. Yeah. Oh, I didn't, uh, I didn't watch that show. But yeah, sorry, spoilers. Um, if you haven't watched the first season, but the, the last- Also, speaking of that show, completely different side note. Speaking about a character not getting their own um, episode. I want, I want, I want an episode of this girl. The oh, redheaded, yeah. head shaved, um, with like the cool Detmer. thing. Detmer. Where's her episode? Yeah, She's so hot. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Oh, I can't wait till y'all finish season two. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did. Got. I'm ready for yeah. it. Excellent. It's so good. I, there's, so there's, there's two more I want to I want to um, hit out here real quick. Um, yeah. They're both kind of old. One is real old. It's from TV. and One's from movies. The one from TV. Um, it's a death, but it's kind of not like, and it, it uh, it's a uh, episode of Andy Griffith. It's a show um, where Opie um, inadvertently with his slingshot kills a mother bird in the tree. Um, but then he hears her eggs hatch and her, her little birdies, they, they, they don't have their mother. Oh. So now he takes in the birds and and raises them to until uh, healthy enough to release into back into the trees. It is one of the most beautiful. It's considered one of the like 100 best episodes of television ever, and it oh, is wow. so, so touching to see this young boy have to learn not only about his his culpability in death. Um, but also how to reconcile with it and to move past it in such a way. It's such a beautiful story. Lena, can I tell you, um, when I was when I was very young, I would spend summers in Chicago with my dad because he worked in Illinois and Florida at the same time. So while he was at work during the summer, we couldn't really go anywhere or do anything. So on WGN, mm-hmm. there were two-hour blocks of television. It was Andy Griffith. Happy Days, and then an, a full hour of Batman 66. <laughs> nice. All two hours. And I remember distinctly seeing that episode of The Andy Griffith Show. Yeah. Wow. And it was, as like an uh, eight or nine year old, it was, I was like, that's so awful. Did anybody? Did like, anybody? just real life and death about those birds. Yeah. <laughs> I talked about art text already. Okay, yes, good, good, good. I mentioned we art. Did. You mentioned art. Like, did the we did. That was traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> we did. The other one, and this was from movies. Um, and this is from the movie Stand by Me, oh. which oh. is you know all about these kids, you know, um, you know, finding the dead body and everything like that. And it's not even the death that you see on screen. Mm. It happens at the end of the movie when they're talking when you we find out what happened to everybody and you ha- find out that river phoenix character died helping somebody mm. that's the one he gets his 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 throat cut right throat cut, right, right. Yeah. right um after being in the military and everything like that and yeah. and, and, and 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 just the way that you know richard dreyfus who's who is um narrating the, the movie speaks that scene tells that scene and then you see River Phoenix kind of just fade off. Mm. The, it, it just, it hits me. Every oh, I remember time. that. That always stuck with me. Yeah, yeah. it's, yeah, that was a good one. And That's the fact cool. that it's not even on screen, it's just like, oh yeah, by the way, this happened to this guy. I was right. like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
the way it is in the in the movie with the member, like he's retelling the memories and they're all just walking and he's gone. Yeah. 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 So there's, a, there's actually two. She's looking up on the on her phone. There's two that came up. One, uh, Seymour and Futurama. Did we? Oh, oh. I, I do not rewatch that episode. It's so well done and it's so. That's sad. the dog, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Yes, we did. That's I so mean, if effective. we're going to talk about dogs, a dog in I Am Legend with Will Smith. <laughs> oh. No, 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 no. If we're going to talk about dogs. It's every dog that died. In <laughs> every dog. <laughs> no, uh, every dog. dog. If right. we're going to talk about dogs, we're going to go back to the world of comics, but not comics, comic strips. And if anybody was a reader of a comic strip, um, for better or worse, by Lynn Johnston, where all yeah. of the characters age in real time, which meant yeah. that their dog, Farley, aged in real time with that comic strip, oh. and then Farley dies in the comic strip because mm. he just he just is an old dog by this mm. time. It is one of the most heartbreaking strips I've ever ever read it's it's so poignant and they deal with it like later because like the, like the kids are now adults and like mm. you know oh my god my childhood dog has died and oh. you know by then the the, the son has a little baby mm. who's like you know ho holding on to old old charlie oh my god it breaks broke broke my heart man mm. well the one that got me was um in uh peanuts when snoopy bit linus and so they had to put him down Minus. Shut up! It was the second time I met someone too. It was really, really bad. Wait, what? Yeah, it was no, brutal. Joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look at Sam. Charlie. Charlie had to just. I'm Charlie had to pull this. I'm sweating. Look at Sam. His uh, desert dwelling cousin. He shaved. Yeah, I mean, you haven't read all of these. You think he is put down? <laughs> Sam. And Woodstock cried. Woodstock gives his eulogy. Shut the front door. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, hang on. There's one uh, in, in Sam, our wait a minute. Sam knew you were joking until Noel <laughs> Cole signed, and then she's like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I love you forever. Um, oh, I'm brother from there is, the hood. There's yes. uh, there is one in uh, uh, that we quote in this house all the time. That's really terrible, but you know. Uh, anyway, uh, did you ever see My Girl? Oh, the bees! No, I've heard about this one. He can't see without his glasses. So both of, us are, both of us have corrective vision. So anytime I'm looking for my glasses, or have you seen my glasses? One or the other of us will be like, "He can't see without his glasses." Where's Aww, your glasses? It's so sad. It is sad. Yeah. That scene. Oh my god, that scene. Oh fuck. Um, there's comments here. I did feel sad when Charlotte from Charlotte's Web died. <laughs> I thought yeah, about it. Too. Everybody yeah. did. Yeah, yeah, that was some sad stuff. Yeah. Oh, Ice Cube's brother. Ooh, from Ricky. The hood. Ricky, right? Uh, Is yeah, that yeah. Thing? Uh, played okay. by Morris Chestnut. Yeah, That's he right. dies. Shot up in the alley. Oh, mm. that was so awful. He had such a future, too. Mm. Oh, and somebody said the worst kid death was the girl from Bridge to Terabithia. Terabithia. I never, uh, I never heard yeah. that. Yeah, I never did no, that either. The worst yeah. kid death. Well, maybe maybe not the worst. I mean, they're all bad. The kid. Oh, what he means to say bad. is my favorite kid death. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but one that I remember hitting me in the fields mm. was when um, Rue died in the Hunger Game. Ooh. Oh. That, I, yeah, that was. That was. Yeah. Bad. Three fingers. Three that. fingers. Sorry. Yeah. Do you guys read um, any of Jerry Spinelli's books? He's from around here. Mm -mm. You know, Maniac no. E or yeah, no, none of those. All right. Well, there was a. Oh, okay. <laughs> It'd be you know. great if he's there. Oh, okay. Carry on. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Okay. I was just asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, uh, moving he's on. A writer. It doesn't matter. Anyway. Let him finish. On. He wrote one of the earlier, uh, just like examples of a of a death that I remember coming across. Um, I think we had to read the book for school or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it was sad. It was this guy's younger brother. Like they were kids. But uh, he's a he's a local author. I'm surprised. Well, you didn't grow up around here, no. But I think he's nationally known. He was on my friend's paper route, actually. <laughs> Um, what, what's the book? What, what are the names? Of, do you know any? Uh, Maniac McGee is probably his best well known. Oh. Um, I did a reading in a park once and he was there like right before 
and then he left. It was a strange kind of thing, but it was cool. Um, so all of his stuff takes place like at Conestoga High School, or this was at uh, the, the this uh, uh, zoo in Norristown. I can't. Space Station Seventh Grade is another one. I think he wrote a book called Star Girl before the DC Comics character, um, hmm. and like one or two others. Um, yeah. Nice. All right, but so yeah. before we get out of here, let's. I, I do want to touch because we we promised. Um, uh, somebody hit me up saying that the, uh, another bad kid death was Thomas Jane's the, uh, kid in the movie oh, The Mist. The Mist. The oh, Mist. Oh, it's oh, messed up. Bleh. Oh my God. That's yeah, that such was, a good pick. Who said that? That's so good. Uh, that was actually a friend of mine who's watching who texted to me, Aaliyah. Uh, hey, you're oh, my God. Win, they win the podcast. Yeah, that wins. Yeah. that's a, God damn it. I took my mother to go see that movie. Ooh. Wow. And we were both like, you want to get some food? <laughs> <laughs> this is I don't a know how to feel right now. Abyss, you guys that's are talking about? The, mi the, mi the Mist. The Mist. Oh, the, that's one of my favorite movie endings of all time. Mine too. It got me so bad. Mine too. I love oh the movie. God, up. Was What's the that? little boy the mist all along? Yes. Yes. <laughs> if you the little boy was the mist the whole time. Yeah. Also, if you ever get a chance, so uh, uh, on DVD they released it, but Frank Darabont's preferred version is the black and white version, and yeah. it is so much creepier. You you you'd be surprised how much grayscale makes everything nastier. Oh yeah, they did a similar so thing or with uh, the, the new Twilight Zone. What'd you say, JD? Repeat that. The new Twilight Zone on CBS. There are two options. There's the full color episodes, or you could watch black and white episodes of the new ones. Interesting. Oh no! Bye. Bye. Sam. Bye. Thank you. I Thank thought you she was just being spooky. Twilight. Oh no, she's yeah. done. I thought it was a Twilight Zone thing. Yeah. Like, do, 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 do. Before we get out of here, let let's touch on some of the resurrections that uh, have that have happened that have meant something that, for the most part, for me, yeah. resur resurrections where they happen, I don't like them because mm -hmm. I, I, I I'm I'm a comp proponent of like it, it, you killed them at least it, at least let them stay dead for a little bit. Like case yep. in point, and you know my favorite character of all time, Batman. I swear, Batman could have been gone for a good twenty years, and I would have been very. Ha Bruce Wayne could have been gone for twenty years. I'd have been happy with Dick Grayson as Batman. Yep. For for twenty years, you know Damian I mean? Wayne as Robin, dude, that was awesome. Was I liked it a lot too. It was good. Yeah, it, but yeah, I was real sad when he came back as quickly as he did. I was bad, but I was also much like him and Captain America. I hated the way they brought him back because, mm. yep. because especially even more so Batman. Okay. He got shot by dark side. So if you want to say that dark side shot him back into time. Okay. I never saw he had that power, but all right, I'm going to go with it. Whatever the fuck they say he shot him with, whatever the we fuck. We also saw it in that. The issue. Omega sanction. The Omega sanction. But we saw it in that issue. So it was a yeah. little different than usual. Like they thought he was dead, but the audience never did. I mean, okay. really did yeah, the way they handled Batman's death was very, very weird because in from jump, it was never that he was actually dead. It's right. that he's away. Right. It was, it was very Yeah, they showed him in a awkward. cave at the end yeah. or something. Yeah. Which I, thought, I bet they were just doing because they're like, no one's gonna believe that we're gonna kill Bruce Wayne. I mean, not yeah. the that we are. You yeah. Know? True, true, true. Yeah. But, but 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 the Captain America one that I mm -hmm. I hated that one more because you literally see somebody go up to him and shoot him <laughs> with a gun. You know. Yep. I mean? And then later, <laughs> and then they're like, "Psych! Like, it was a time travel gun, you idiots." Yeah. And was, I'm like, and it was Sharon too, right? Didn't they like? And it was Sharon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking yeah. bullshit. That was bullshit. Yeah. You know what? Though? Hang on. Um. Captain America's resurrection was bullshit. However, everything that begat that, the resurrection of Bucky Barnes, was one of the best things in comics. That was yeah, good. resurrecting Bucky Barnes was a great idea. But that, like, that was the start of the entire story that led to the death and then the eventual resurrection of, of yeah. Captain America. Because Bucky Barnes, like when, the, when he died, the, the book became an ensemble piece 
mm-hmm. with a very unconfident or or not super confident Captain America with his team, and it was the best thing I've been I, I had ever read. It was amazing. It was mm-hmm. Amazing, yes, it was. Uh, uh, so- action. Action figure expert says, what about Ellen Ripley in Alien Resurrection? Uh, action figure expert, earlier, I was talking about that, and it wasn't an Alien Resurrection. It was an Alien 3. Yeah. yeah. We talked about that. Hmm. However, if we're talking about Resurrections, after Ripley dies in Alien 3, Alien Resurrection brings her back in the future, and she's mixed. She's had her DNA mixed with Alien DNA. Oh. Yeah, 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 that's right. Did you like that? I thought it was kind of cool. Uh, and then Winona Ryder shows up. And then there's, there's a scene where uh, Sigourney Weaver, for some reason, unbeknownst to the audience, plays sexy basketball. Mm, that makes sense. <laughs> that was a really weird movie. Let's not really it talk. Was a, yeah. Yeah. Um, somebody did mention in there Colossus. Mm. I love the resurrection of Colossus. Yeah. Only because of the great stories in Astonishing X-Men. Yeah. But I don't disagree with the comment of maybe they should never have brought him back because they, it took no away way. from him sacrificing himself for the legacy virus. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah, never agree. Colossus never really did that much for me as a character. He was a, another guy I liked the Flash. The best thing they ever did was die. So just leave mm. him dead. Yeah. Uh, my I'll, favorite I'll, resurrection. Resurrection, you guys. I what? love a good resurrection because they were gone and now they are back. <laughs> like the character is back. You know? I hate it. I hate it. Oh, it's the it's <laughs> something that it's like, oh, they killed this guy. Hopefully he'll come back in a little bit, you know, that kind of thing. Comics is really the only place that you get that. Like, because it's the only thing that goes on. Uh, long it's not enough. true. You obviously haven't watched all of the Fast and the Furious movies, but go Ooh. ahead, continue. I haven't watched a single Look, you triggered me. I'm triggered. <laughs> the Fast and the Furious movies. But are- you guys have also talked about how comic y they are. So, they actually are very comic Right, right. Um, you know, that's the only place that you really get that. And it's one thing that I like about, you know, like, well, maybe they'll come back eventually. Um, now, one that one that really touched me, if I may, is that, um, so I was reading this comic, DC Universe Zero, and it's a pretty awesome story about this entity that is all things, right? It's like, doesn't even have an identity because it is all things. And the process of this of this comic was both an ad for upcoming DC stories. Mm-hmm. So this this being was kind of mentally checking in on different aspects of the DC universe, and while doing that, uh, realigning its personality, right, and remembering who it is. And I'm and I'm like, is it Dark Side? Because he was gone at the time. Is it this guy? Is it that guy? Could not figure it out until the very last page and you guys, I was beside myself. I could not believe that this would happen ever. And it was happening. It was the flash. It was Barry Allen. And it was an awesome story. Great sci-fi concept. He's like remembering his own identity by seeing these things. And not only was it a great story, but Barry Allen was coming back. The guy who you thought would never come back um, I strongly disagree that the best thing they ever did was kill him. Uh, although I love the Wally West flash stories. They're awesome. Uh, but it was just so unexpected that it would ever happen. He was the byword him and Bucky for a character who actually stays dead in comics. Uh, Bucky, Gwen Stacy, uncle Ben. Yeah. I don't used to be uncle Jason ben. Todd. See, I don't count uncle Ben cause he's part of the origin story, but yeah, Gwen Stacy and Jason Todd too. But Gwen Stacy's not a hero. There's mm. less reason. And Jason Todd was like, eh, nobody much cared for Jason Todd. Uh, they stayed uh, because they produce good stories. Cap's angst about Bucky being dead and Wally West's trying to fill the roles of Barry Allen. They were successful in their death is why I assume they didn't come back. Um, but, uh, but I also think, J.D., I think I mentioned this to you the other day. Barry Allen is one of the only characters, the only heroic characters that I can think of who becomes a hero because he thinks it would be cool, right? There's no tragedy. He gets his powers, and he's like, hey, I used to read this comic about a guy called The Flash. I loved it. I'm going to call myself I mean, The Flash. I mean, like that version of The Flash, but like the current or... Ah, uh, yes, yes. His but, mother was killed, right? I understand that, though. But uh, so he... I wonder if that's part of the story reality 
that let him stay dead. He has the tragedy at the end of his story. And then when he comes mm -hmm. back, they put a tragedy in his beginning. You know what I mean? It's just an yeah. interesting narrative sort of thing. An unnecessary tragedy too. It's. I find it to be very interesting. I'd rather it was somebody other than the Flash because I like him as a happy character. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Who just wanted to be the Flash, you know? Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, man. Oh, I was blown away at that resurrection. This thing that I had wanted for so long, but just assumed would never happen. And it happened. I... I actually have two resurrections that uh, I jumped back into comics for or during around. Um, JD won't like this, but Green Lantern Rebirth. Ooh, that was my. That was going to be my pick. Oh yeah. It's so, it's well, so only cool. because I know that you love Kyle Rayner. So no, yeah, that I was about to go on a whole thing about Green Lantern Rebirth. Go ahead. All right. So before you do it, though, I'll say the other one, and then we could like tag team Green okay. Lantern Rebirth. Right. Um, bringing back uh, Oliver Queen. Uh, Kevin Smith yeah. bringing back Oliver Queen after Zero Hour. Mm -hmm. um, I had not never read Zero Hour, but I was a big fan of Kevin Smith early high school or late high school, early college. So I started picking up his Green Arrow run, and it was a reintroduction to this character that I had never read before. Mm. And it was so wonderful. And mm. apparently, in normal continuity, it was a re it was a rebirth. It was a it was a resurrection, but it was for me. It was the first time experience I had with him. But the the storytelling of that uh, of it being, I need to take this time as a writer to remind you of all the things that are great about this character while they're being reborn was the perfect primer, and it made me love Oliver Queen. I just, I, I think I think Green Arrow is awesome because of that. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So your other one, Green Lantern Rebirth, that was my number one rebirth of all time. Mm. Um, the, not, I don't care. Um, Hal, I loved Hal Jordan. I liked Hal Jordan very much. Uh, yeah. I remember reading the Pat Broderick one where they were like, he was just walking the earth. Um, mm -hmm. right. and, uh, like Kane. And, um, <laughs> uh, but then they killed him and they killed him in such a fantastical, crazy bonkers way that affected me. Uh, the fact that he murders all of the green lantern core members out there in space was like, boom, I couldn't believe it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That, that cover. Oh, oh he's got all the rings. Uh, and didn't he destroy ah, a, so city? a city? No, oh, just city. Fuck it. The Return of Super Lantern Corps. Fuck it. Like he killed Everything and everyone. Yeah. Well, no, the city, uh, his his city gets destroyed by Cyborg Superman at the end of oh, the sorry, um, right. death yeah. of Superman. And then there's an issue where uh, he he's dealing with it. He's kind of like, fine. Mm -hmm. But then I guess after that, they decided, let's do let's kill Hal Jordan. So then he decides to go crazy after the fact. Mm. Um, do you know so a bit of a con about like the story that they were going to do and all that stuff? What? Do you know the story about like he was going to become a guy called the protector and internalize the oh. power? It's interesting. We can talk about it another time. Oh, okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, the fact that they killed him, I was like, oh, that was pretty brutal. And then I met Kyle Rayner, who I liked very much. And it was really Kyle and, and Wally West relationship that I loved. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they decided, you know, we have to bring back Hal, I was like, all right, fine, whatever. But the way that Jeff Johns did it, and he was able to take all of these different things from different issues and put them all together uh, and make it cohesive. And the fact that he added the rainbow spectrum of emotions, uh, yeah. I thought was so badass and so cool. And it really set up Green Lantern for a whole new generation. Uh, shame about Ethan Van Skyver, but yeah. yeah, I love, I love yeah. the story itself. Yeah, he did. He really, this was the, his first like showing his mastery of that, like, let's pull continuity together in a way that it looks like it was always supposed to be that way, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Green Lantern Rebirth was one of the, so, um, like I said before, the, the jump back into comic books, like around college time, Green Lantern Rebirth was one of the things that I borrowed. Like mm -hmm. it was Green Lantern Lieber, uh, Rebirth, um, Identity Crisis, a couple of hand, a handful of things, and then also, um, Jeff Loeb and Ed McGinnis's Batman Superman. Wow. Actually, when I came back, I jumped in hard with DC. Those Rebirth and Batman Superman and Flash Ignition were where I started to notice that like Silver Age stuff was coming back into yep. DC. Yeah. And that was an exciting resurrection too. At least, at least leveraging Silver Age stuff, like taking yeah. those strokes and then 
modernizing them. Yeah. Yeah. Like Wally had a secret identity again. Hal was back. Other colors of kryptonite. I think Luther at the end of that says like a crisis is coming. Something like yeah, that. Yeah. And the next thing that kind of came was identity crisis, which didn't necessarily make sense, but whatever. Yeah. Before we get out of here, um, action figure expert asked the question, are there any Marvel or DC characters that should have stayed permanently deaf? No. Dead? Um, Jason Todd. <laughs> oh, I like what they've done with Jason Todd after him. I like him way more now than I ever did before. You know. I, I, what, do they do, I, what do they do with Jason Todd? They did the who's who's under the red hood, which was awesome. And then ever since then he has been wasted. I agree with that. Like I, I really loved Under the Red Hood, but other than that, yeah, 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 I, I agree. Jason Ty, Jason Ty could have stayed dead for my money. I'm sorry, JD. I'm sorry, B. Um, Barry Allen and Hal Jordan could have stayed could have stayed six feet under. Um, I agree. You uh, said Hal Jordan too. No, no. Yeah, I yeah, agree. No, Hal is great. Hal's fine. No, no, no. How how that how, how's corny? Like um, <laughs> I, I I think that you could have had all of that the spectrum of colors and a rainbow mm -hmm. co connection with the Green Lanterns and everything like that, and it would have resonated. It could have been done with mm -hmm. Kyle, John, and Guy. You yeah, sure. Who individually you each could. of them are more interesting characters than how Jordan was before he went batshit crazy, got great temples. And died. But he's the best that he was left. Uh, <laughs> Green Lantern. I, I like the story Green Lantern Rebirth. I don't need Hal Jordan anymore. Yo, Sinestro Core War, though, came right out of that it was, and was. It was good. And yeah, those were great Lantern. stories, but they didn't need to be Hal. It could have been, it could have been John. But, but they but, were. But all like John, uh, Guy, and. and uh, guy. What's guy. his name? What's his Kyle. 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 Yeah, whatever. They had amazing pieces of that story, like in the Green Lantern Corps book. True. No, 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 no. True. They had amazing pieces of that story because they were making room for Hal. I mean, they, when was the last time you read Sinestro Corps War? It lit like Hal was not able to do it alone, and him and Kyle yeah. tag team Sinestro. Hal awesome. didn't need to be there. They but he didn't was there. need Hal because they said it so. That's Respectfully, why. And it was awesome. And I'll tell you guys what. Uh, Barry Allen's Barry Allen's stories since his resurrection, I'll tell you, they have not been the greatest. I'm still happy about his resurrection, but I do miss the like I, I agree with Barry Allen, but I don't agree with Hal Jordan. I think they've done something with Hal Jordan. They've moved the entire DC line and the universe with Hal Jordan. With Barry Allen, it's been a handful of really interesting arcs. They weren't sure what to do with, with Wally. They've yeah, that part sucks. They've too. Mashed back and forth. Like, Hal makes sense. Barry? Barry's great. Don't get me wrong. A great okay. user of the Speed Force, and that's what I love. You know, okay. Kill him! All right, you're both wrong. Um, <laughs> then, <laughs> the, other one, the other one for me, and then I'll let y'all talk, is that um, I would have I been happy if Elektra never came back. Yeah, I don't really have any. I don't think I've read that stuff. How about this? I'll say I'd be happy if she never came back, except when she was killed right before Secret Invasion, and it was revealed to be a scroll imposter. So oh, let's yeah, say I remember that. She was always dead, wow. but it was only was a cool. scroll that ever came back. Mm -hmm. Then I'd be happy because the way that they used her that was cool. in that regards was awesome. Hmm. Okay, I'll give you that. Like so, she's still dead. Mm. Like killing her the second time was actually a feint, mm. and I'd be happy. I thought it was bullshit when they brought back Aunt May because one of my which one of my time? big deaths from <laughs> earlier, which I didn't exactly. Uh, the one I was excited about, the one of the big deaths for me was the uh, there was an old Amazing Spider-Man issue from the '90s, and uh, the um, it was an embossed grave mm -hmm. yeah. on the front. And she has a beautiful death. She dies uh, peacefully, you know, and Peter says, you know, third star on the right on straight. Uh, wait, was it third star on the right and straight on till morning or something from Peter Pan? Yeah. And and I, I got I got tears in my eyes. That was so great. And then during the whole clone saga thing, mm. right, uh, Osborne comes back and he's like, I got May. And the whole time you think he's talking about his daughter, May, right. who was supposed to have died in childbirth, but Norman. 
Osborne had stolen away. Mm. And then when he goes to save his daughter, May, he finds out it's actually Ma Aunt May. Yeah. My and my I was like, ah, oh, fuck you. <laughs> I have a, I have a, what's that? I have a question. Not a question, but uh, uh, a recent death and how you guys feel about it. Um, Alfred, how Not do you feel about Alfred being killed? Not into it. Yeah. I'm waiting until they bring him back. Well, the sooner the better, in my opinion. You know, if it happens. I, I'm fine with it, um, but I'm yeah. I'm waiting. I'm purposefully not giving a damn at all yeah. till at least a year passes. Also, the whole fact that he wasn't, like, the story was not for him to have been killed. And then they just decided, like, hey, it would be pretty sweet if we killed yeah, Alfred. Apparently, editorial decided, yeah. like, let's keep this for a while. Yeah. So like, it was, it was, uh, and T Tom King did it knowing, like, had like an idea of, uh, right. an right. way out. Yeah. But editorial was like, no, let's look. Let's it was a play face. Wow. Yeah. yeah. All right. It, we've been talking for two hours. This okay. has been so, so much fun. <laughs> I didn't think it was going yeah. to be as, as, as much. Remember, we were like, all right, guys, we'll do an hour, hour and a half tops. <laughs> right. Coming in right on time. Only a half hour longer than we planned. This was so much fun. I hope that you, the people that have been checking this out, enjoy it. Um, uh, this was fun to do. This is this is basically what you're watching. This is Gutter Talk, which is a, a, a podcast presentation of the Black Tribbles, as well as Cult Pop, which is my man Johnny Destructo's home of fantastic podcasts. You can go to Cult Pop, look it up on all, every place you find podcasts. They do the spoiler alert, which is this whole crew right here, where we review comic books. Um, they do the um, uh, Cannibal horror cast isn't that there you go yeah because they were viewing horror movies they do they do a whole lot of cool stuff over there they've got more podcasts coming your way and you'll probably see one or all of us on one or two of them as well because deep down inside we all just like podcasting together <laughs> <laughs> almost like talking to you guys sometimes i'm like all right there's an audience then <laughs> 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 Occasionally. 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 Before yeah. we go, everybody, starting with Brian, then we'll go Noel, then we'll go JD. Tell everybody where they can get in touch with you, how they can find you online. Uh, Brian Lieb, if you do a Google search, I might come up. I don't know. There might be some other ones. But at brianliebdesign.com, that is my product design website. And uh, you can also email me at brianliebdesign at gmail.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Mr. Bartocci, M. R B A R T O C C I and or with these fools every week uh, or um, the cult pop podcast, social media feeds. I will respond if you incite me. <laughs> I'm Johnny Destructo and uh, you can check me out at my local comic shop local to me. It's uh, Johnny Destructo's hero complex, 4327 main street in Philadelphia, PA. I am still doing mail out. So if there's graphic novels or, or anything that you need from your local, your comic shop, but it's closed. Hit me up. Let me know. And uh, oh, you can tweet at me at JD's Hero Complex. And uh, that's it. And yo, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to uh, help the Tribbles out, feel free. Go hit up our Patreon.com slash Black Tribbles. Give us a couple of shekels. We're going to be, I used to do the uh, greetings from the Bat Base podcast from there. The Bat Base is being rebuilt even as we speak. I was down there working out the the the, uh, the arrangements today. The bookshelves oh. are coming. The lights are coming. It's going to yeah, be I'm insane. I thinking like working out. Yeah, you're doing like a montage. I was doing, I was doing a, bat, I was doing a Bruce Wayne style workout in yeah. the bad cave. It's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing. So go to Patreon.com, hit us up, follow the Black Tribbles, or any place you find podcasts on YouTube, Facebook, join the Facebook group, Tribble Nation. Email us at blacktribbles at gmail.com. Holla, 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 holla at the Tribble, and check us out every Thursdays at 9 p.m. where we bring you the regular Black Tribbles show right here on Facebook and YouTube, and on Fridays. Check out my man Dante with the Infinity Equation when they talk about action figures and toys uh, right here on YouTube. All right. Until later, peace. Be safe. Show some love to the first responders and the people out there that got to leave your homes to go do the Lord's work out in these um, COVID streets. Um, Essential workers! Most definitely. Most definitely. And uh, we will be bringing you more insanity soon, so stay tuned. It'll be coming. Until then, everybody be safe and be well. Love you.